Chapter 17 of the Ischiel Mystery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit www.librivox.org. Recording by Garth Comira. The Ischiel Mystery by Mrs. Charles Bryce. Chapter 17. Behind the shrubberies, which lay at the back of the holly hedge that surrounded the little enclosed garden outside the library, beyond the end of the battlements, and reached by a disused footpath, a great tree stood upon the edge of the steep hillside, and thrust its sweeping branches over the void. Its trunk was gray and moss-grown. Moss carpeted the ground between its protruding roots. But the bracken and heather held back, and left a half-circle beneath it, untenanted by their kind. It would seem that all vegetation fears to venture beneath the shade of the beach, and for the most part it stands solitary, shunned by other growing things except moss, which creeps undaunted where its more vigorous brothers lack the courage to establish themselves. Here came Juliet that morning. A week ago David Southern had shown her the path to the tree. It had been a favorite haunt of his when he was a boy, he told her. It was a private chamber to which he resorted on the rare occasions when he was disposed to solitude. When something had gone wrong with his world, he had been used to retire there with his dog, or, more seldom, a book. There he had been accustomed to lie, his back supported by the tree, and hold forth to the dog upon the troubles and difficulties of life, and the general crookedness of things. Or, if a book were his companion, he would gaze out between the pages at distant Cryonon, clinging faintly to the knees of Benguzi, and watch the swift change of passing cloud and hanging curtain of mist upon the faces of the hills and loch. It had been a place all his own, secret from everyone, even from Mark, his companion during all those holidays that he had spent it in Verishiel. Somehow David told Juliet, and it was a confidence he had seldom before imparted to anyone. He had never quite managed to hit it off with Mark. He couldn't say why exactly. No doubt it was his own fault. But there was no accounting for one's likes and dislikes. And with quick regret at having betrayed his carefully suppressed feelings in regard to his cousin, David had laughed apologetically and spoken of other things. Here, then, just as the steamer Rob Roy was drawing close to the wooden landing stage at the edge of the lock, with Juliet Romaninoff still standing in the bows. Here, because she had once been to this place with him, because without her he had so often sat upon these mossy roots, came Juliet to dream of her love. Like him, she seated herself against the tree trunk at the giddy brink of the precipitous rock. Like him, her eyes rested on the smooth waters below her, or on the faraway misty distance where Cryonon slumbered. But, unlike him, her eyes, as they looked, were filled with tears. Where was he now? Oh, David! Poor unjustly treated David! In what narrow cell, lighted only by a high iron-barred window, for so the scene shaped itself in her mind, with uncovered floor of stone, bare walls, and a bench to lie on, was the man she loved, wearing away his days under the burden of so frightful an accusation. For the thousandth time, Juliet's blood boiled within her at the thought, and she grew hot with anger and indignant scorn, that anyone should have dared to suspect him. Why were such fools, such wicked, evil-working imbeciles as the police, allowed to exist for one moment upon the face of the globe. But no doubt they had some hidden motive in arresting him, for it was quite incredible that they really imagined he had committed this appalling crime. She could not understand their motive, to be sure, but without doubt there must have been some reason which was not clear to her. Oh, David, David! Was he thinking of her as she was thinking of him? Did he know, by instinct, that she would be doing all that could be done to bring about his release? But was she? Again her mind was filled with the disquieting question. Was there nothing that might be done that she was leaving undone? 
Had she forgotten something? Neglected something? She was sure Gimlet did not believe David to be guilty, but was he certain of being able to prove his innocence? He did not seem to have discovered much at present. Suddenly, in the midst of her distress, she smiled to herself. At least Miss Tarver had shown herself in her true colors, and was no more to be considered. Juliet felt that she could almost forgive her for her readiness to believe the worst. It was dreadful, yes, and shameful that anyone else should think for a moment that David could be capable of such a deed. But in Miss Tarver, perhaps, the thought had not been inexcusable. On the whole, it was so nice of her to break the engagement that she might be forgiven the ridiculous reason she had advanced for doing it. Of course, Juliet assured herself, it was a mere pretext, because no one could possibly believe it, and in this manner she continued to reiterate her conviction that the suspicions entertained of her lover were all assumed for some darkly obscure purpose. So the morning wore away. A shower or two passed down the valley, but under the thick tent of the beech leaves she scarcely felt it. She was, besides, dressed for the bad weather, and the gray and mournful face of the day was in harmony with her mood. There was something comforting in this high perch. She seemed more aloof from the troubles and despair of the last few days than she had imagined possible. There was a calm, a remoteness about the gray mountains, disappearing and reappearing from behind their screen of cloud, but unchanged and unmoved by what went on around and among them, that was in some way reassuring. The burn that ran at the bottom of the hill on which she sat, hurrying down to the lock in such turbulent foaming haste, she was able to compare, with a sad smile, to herself. The lock, she thought, was wide and impassive as justice, which did not allow itself to be influenced by the emotions. The burn would get down just the same, without so much turmoil and fuss, and she would see David's name cleared, equally surely, if she waited calmly on events, instead of burning her heart out in hopeless impatience and anxiety. As she gazed with some such thoughts as these, down to the stream that splashed on its way below her, her attention was caught by a movement in the bushes halfway down the deep slope at the top of which she was sitting. The day was windless, and no leaf moved on any tree. There must be some animal among the shrubs that covered the embankment, some large animal, since its movements caused so much commotion, for as she watched, first one bush and then another stirred and bent and was shaken as if by something thrusting its way through the dense growth. What could it be? A sheep, perhaps. There were many of them on the hillside. This must be one that had strayed far from the rest. And yet would a sheep make so much stir? Juliet drew back a little behind the trunk of the beech tree. Could it be a deer? She could not hear any sound of the creature's advance, for the air was full of the clamor of the burn, but she could trace the direction of its progress by shaking leaves and swinging boughs. It seemed to be gradually mounting the slope. Suddenly a head emerged from the waving mass of rhododendron, and with astonishment Juliet saw that it was that of Julia Romaninoff. Her first impulse was to lean forward and call her, but as she did so the cry died upon her lips, for the manner of Juliet's advance struck her as very odd. The girl was bending nearly double, and moving with a caution that seemed very strange and unnecessary. What was the matter? Was she stalking something? Crouching as she was in the bushes, she would not be seen by anyone on the path below. Did she not want to be seen? It looked more and more like it. But why in the world should Julia creep along as if she feared to be observed? Where was she going? And why? Suddenly Juliet came to a quick decision she would find out what Julia Romaninoff was doing. She backed hurriedly into the bracket, and made her way slowly and cautiously around the clearing under the beech tree to the edge of the hill again, keeping under cover of the fern and heather. When she peered over, Julia had disappeared from view beneath the rhododendrons. For a minute Juliet's eyes searched the side of the slope below. Then she drew back her head quickly, for she had caught sight of another bush shaking uneasily, a little way beyond the gap in which she had had her first glimpse of the cause of the disturbance. Cowering low in the bracken, she crept along the top, keeping a foot or two from the edge, where the rock fell nearly perpendicularly for a few yards, 
before its angle changed to the comparatively gradual, though actually steep, slope of the hill which Julia was climbing. From time to time she looked cautiously between clumps of fern or heath, to make sure that she was keeping level with her unconscious quarry. The front of the hill swung around in a bold curve till it reached the castle, and it soon became evident that, if both girls continued to advance along the lines they were following, they would converge at a point where the end of the battlemented wall met the great holly hedge that formed two sides of the garden enclosure. Juliet perceived this when she was not more than a dozen yards from the corner, and dropped at full length to the soft ground, at a spot where she could see between the stalks and under the leaves, and yet herself remained concealed. She had not long to wait. In a minute Julia's face appeared over the brow of the hill. She pulled herself up by a young fir sapling that hung over the brink, and stood for a moment, flushed and panting after her long climb. She was dressed in a greenish tweed, which blended with the woodland surroundings, and her shoulder was turned to the place where Juliet lay wondering whether she would be discovered. Fronting them, the end of the little turret, with which the wall of the old fortress now came to a sudden termination, could be seen rearing its gray stones above the dark glossy foliage of the hedge, which grew here with peculiar vigor, and continued to the extreme edge of the cliff, and even farther. What was Juliet's surprise to see Julia when she had found her breath, and taken one quick look round to satisfy herself she was unobserved, suddenly cast herself down in her turn upon the damp earth, and inserting her head beneath the prickly barricade of the holly leaves, begin to crawl and wiggle forward until she had completely disappeared underneath it. What in the world could she be doing? Minutes passed, and she did not reappear. Juliet waited, her nerves stretched in expectation, but nothing happened. Overhead little birds, tomtits and creepers, played about the bank of the fir trees. A robin came and looked at her consideringly, with a bright, sensible eye. From two hundred feet below, the murmur of the burn rose constant and insistent, but no other sound broke the stillness, nor was there any sign of human life upon the top of the cliff. At last the girl could stand it no longer. Her patience was exhausted. Curiosity urged her like a goad, and, if she had not much expectation of making any important discovery, she was at least determined to solve the mystery that now perplexed her. Without more ado, she got to her feet and ran to the holly hedge. There, throwing herself down once more, she parted the leaves with a cautious hand and followed the path taken by the Russian. The hedge was old and very thick, more than three yards in width at this end of it. In the middle, the trunks of the trees that formed it rose in a close-growing, impassable barrier. But just opposite the place where Julia had vanished, Juliet found that there was a gap caused, perhaps, by the death in earlier days of one of the trees, or, as she afterwards thought more likely, by the intentional omission or destruction of one of the young plants. It was a narrow opening, but she managed to wriggle through it. On the other side, progress was bounded by the wall, whose massive granite blocks presented a smooth, unbroken surface. Where, then, had Julia gone? The branches did not grow low on this as on the outer side of the hedge, and there was room to stand, though not to stand upright. Stooping uncomfortably, the girl looked about her, and saw in the soft brown earth the plain print of many footsteps, both going and coming, between the place where she crouched and the end of the wall. She looked behind her, and there were no marks. Clearly Julia had gone to the end. But what then? The corner of the wall was at the very edge of the precipice, from what she had remembered to have seen from below, the rock was too sheer to offer any foothold. Besides, why having just climbed to the summit should anyone immediately descend again, and by such an extraordinary route? While these thoughts followed one another in her mind, Juliet had advanced along the track of the footsteps, and clinging tightly to the trunk of the last holly bush, she leant forward and looked down. As she thought, the descent was impossible. The rock fell away at her feet, sheer and smooth. There was no path that a cat could take. It made her giddy to look, and she drew back hurriedly. Where then could Julia have gone? Not to the left, that was certain, for then she would have emerged again into view. To the right? That seemed impossible. 
Still, Juliet leant forward again and peered round the corner of the wall. There, not more than a couple of feet away, was a small opening, less than eighteen inches wide by about a yard in height. Hidden by the overhanging edge of the hedge, it would be invisible from below. Here was the road Juliet had taken. Juliet did not hesitate. She could reach the aperture easily, and it would have been the simplest thing in the world to climb into it, but for the yawning chasm beneath. Holding firmly to the friendly holly, and resisting, with an effort, the temptation to look down, she swung herself bravely over the edge and scrambled into the hole with a gasp of relief. It was, after all, not very difficult. She found herself standing within the entrance of a narrow passage built into the thickness of the wall. Beside the opening through which she had come, a little door of oak, gray with age and strengthened with rusty bars and cross-piece of iron, drooped upon its one remaining hinge. Two huge slabs of stone leading near it against the wall showed how it had been the custom in former centuries to fortify the entrance still more effectively in time of danger. Juliet did not wait to examine these fragments, interesting though they might be to archaeologists, but hurried down the passage as quickly as she could in the darkness that filled it, feeling her way with an outstretched hand upon the stones on either side. As her eyes became accustomed to the obscurity, she saw that though the way was dark it was yet not entirely so. A gloomy light penetrated at intervals through ivy-covered loopholes pierced in the thickness of the outer wall, and she imagined bygone mechanicans pouring boiling oil or other hospitable greeting through those slits on to the heads of their neighbors. But surely, she reflected, no one would ever have attacked the castle from that side, where the precipice already offered an impregnable defense. The passage must have been used as a means of communication with the outer world, or perhaps as a last resort for the purpose of escape by the beleaguered forces. After fifty yards or so of comparatively easy progress, the shafts of twilight from the loopholes ceased to permeate the murky darkness in which she walked, and she was obliged to go more slowly and to feel her way dubiously by the touch of hands and feet. The floor appeared to her to be sloping away beneath her, and as she advanced the descent became more and more rapid till she could hardly keep her feet. She went very gingerly, with a vague fear lest the path should stop unexpectedly, and she herself step into space. Presently she found herself once more upon level ground, when another difficulty confronted her. The walls came suddenly to an end. Feeling cautiously about her in the darkness, she made out that she had come to a point where another passage crossed the one she was following, a sort of crossroad in this unknown country of shade and stone. Here, then, were three possible routes to take, and no means of knowing which of them Julia Romanov had gone by. After a little hesitation, she decided to keep straight on. It would at all events be easier to return if she did, and she would be less likely to make a mistake and lose her way. So on she stumbled, and who shall say that fate had not a hand in this chance decision? Though the distance she traversed was inconsiderable, the darkness and uncertainty made it appear to her immense, and each moment she expected to come upon the Russian girl. At every other step she paused and listened, but no sound met her ears except a slight, regular thudding noise, which she presently discovered, with something of a shock, to be the beating of her own heart. The sound of her progress was almost inaudible. As the day was damp and she was wearing galoshes, and her small, rubber-shod feet fell upon the stone floor with a gentle pattern that was scarcely perceptible. At last she fell over the first step of a flight of stairs. She mounted them one by one with every precaution her fears could suggest, for by now the first enthusiasm of the chase had worn off, and the solitude and darkness of this strange place had worked upon her nerves till she was terrified of she knew not what, and ready to scream at a touch. Already she bitterly regretted having started out upon this enterprise of spying. Why had she not gone and reported what she had seen to Mr. Gimblet? That surely would have been the obvious, the sensible course. It was, she reflected, a course still open to her, and in another moment she would have turned and taken it, but even as the thought crossed her mind, she was aware that the darkness was sensibly decreased, and in another second she had risen into comparative daylight. 
as she stood still debating what she should do and taking in all that could now be distinguished of her surroundings she saw that the stairs ended in an open trap door leading to a high black-lined shaft like the inside of a chimney in which some two feet above the trap an odd narrow curve of glass acted as a window and admitted a very small quantity of light a streak of light seemed to come also from the wall beside it juliet drew herself cautiously up till her head was in the chimney and her eyes level with the slip of glass with a sudden shock of surprise she saw that she was looking into the room which above all others she had so much cause to remember ever having entered it was indeed the library of the castle and she was looking at it from the inside of that clock into which Gimlet had once before seen Juliet Romaninov vanish. The curtains were drawn in the room, but after the absolute blackness of the stone corridors, the semi-dusk looked nearly as bright as full daylight to Juliet, and she had no difficulty in distinguishing that there was but one person in the library, and that person Julia. She was standing by a bookshelf at the far end, near the window, and seemed to be methodically engaged in an examination of the books. Juliet saw her take out first one, then another musty, leather-bound volume, shake it, turn over the leaves, and put it back in its place after groping with her hand at the back of the shelf. Plainly she was hunting for something. But for what? She had no business where she was, in any case and Juliet's indignation gathered and swelled within her as she watched this unwarrantable intrusion. She would confront the girl and ask her what she meant by such behavior, but how to get into the library. Looking about her, she saw that the streak of light in the wall beside her came through a perpendicular crack which might well be the edge of a little door. She pushed gently, and the wood yielded to her fingers. End of chapter 17 Recording by Garth Comira. Chapter 18 of The Ashel Mystery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mary Herndon Bell. The Ashel Mystery by Mrs. Charles Bryce. Chapter 18. Later on in the afternoon, when Gimlet arrived at the castle, he was immediately shown into the presence of Lord Ashiel, who was pacing the smoking-room restlessly, a cigarette between his teeth. He looked pale and haggard. The strain of the last few days had evidently been too much for him. Gimlet greeted him sympathetically. "'You have not found your uncle's will, I can see,' he began and you are fretting at the idea of keeping his daughter out of her fortune. But set your mind at rest. We shall be able to put that right. Is she here, by the way? he added, remembering Lady Ruth's anxiety. Here? Of course not. What do you mean? cried Mark, stopping suddenly in his walk. Well, I was sure she was not, Gimlet replied. But I promised to ask. Lady Ruth is rather upset because Miss Byrne did not come in to lunch. I told her she had probably gone for a longer walk than had been her intentions, he added soothingly, for Mark was looking at him with a disturbed expression. He seemed relieved, however, by the detective's suggestion. Yes, no doubt that would be the reason, he murmured, lighting a fresh cigarette and throwing himself down in an easy chair with his hands clasped behind his head. No, I haven't found any will, and there's not a corner left that I haven't turned inside out. I suppose he never really made it, just talked about it, probably, as people are so fond of doing. And now I'm at a loose end, all alone in this big house with no one to speak to, and nothing to do with myself. It's a beast of a day, or I should go out and try for a salmon in self-defense. Tomorrow I shall go south. And you— have you found out anything new about the murder yet? I have found out one thing which you will be glad to hear, said Gimlet, and that is the place where the missing will is concealed. What? cried Mark, leaping to his feet. Where is it? What does it say? Give it to me. 
I haven't got it, Gimblet told him. I don't know what it says, but I know where to look for it. It is in the statue your uncle put up on the track known as the Green Way. I have found a memorandum of his which sets the matter beyond a doubt. And he related at length the story of the half-sheet of paper with the mysterious writing, and how he had learnt by accident of the manner in which the statue fitted in with the obscure directions, omitting nothing except the fact that he had already acted on the information so far as to make certain of the actual existence of the tin box, and saying that he should prefer the papers to be brought to light in the presence of a magistrate. I believe there are other documents there besides the will, he said, without troubling to explain what excellent reasons he had for such a belief. I understood from your uncle that there might be some of an almost international importance. In case any dispute should subsequently arise about them, I wish to have more than one reliable witness to their being found. Can you send a man over to the lodge at Glenliquit and ask General Tenby to come back with him? I am told that he is a magistrate. Gimlet did not think it necessary to relate how he had obtained possession of the sheet of paper bearing the injunction to face curiosity. His adventures on that night savoured too strongly of housebreaking to be drawn attention to. "'Your uncle must have posted it to me in London the day before he died,' he said mendaciously. "'It was forwarded here, and at first I could make neither head nor tail of it.' "'Why didn't you tell me?' Mark asked impatiently. "'And yet,' he added, reflecting, "'I might not have seen to what it referred. "'Yes, of course. I will send over for General Tenby. "'He can't come for three or four hours, though, which will make it rather late. "'Are you sure we had not better open the thing sooner? "'The bull's horn at the southeast corner turns like a key, you say. "'Suppose someone else finds that out, and makes off with whatever may be hidden there.' I am absolutely sure we needn't fear anything of the sort, because I have the best of reasons for being positive that no one has the slightest inkling of the secret, Gimlet assured him. There is a whole gang of scoundrels after the document of which your uncle told me, who are ready to spend any money or risk any penalty in order to obtain it. They will not be deterred even by having to pay for it with their lives. You may be quite sure that if any one had suspected where it was concealed, it would not have been allowed to remain there, and we should find the cash empty. But we may safely argue that they have not found it, since in that case they certainly would not hang about the neighborhood. Do you mean to say, cried Mark, that you think there are any of these nihilist people lurking about? That letter which came from Uncle Douglas, the letter from Paris, I guessed it meant something of the sort. There is a foreigner staying at Cryannan, said Gimlet, whom I have every reason to suspect. More than that, there has been a Russian in your very midst, who, I am afraid you will be shocked to hear, is hand in glove with him. Whom do you mean? exclaimed Mark. Not, not Julia Romanoff. It seemed to the detective that he winced as he uttered the name of the girl. Silently Gimblet bowed his head, and for a minute the two men stood without a word. Then, stammered Mark, you think that she, that she— Oh, he cried, I can hardly believe that. Gimblet did not reply, but after a few moments walked over to the writing table and spread out a piece of note paper. He kept his back turned towards the young man, who seemed thankful for an opportunity to recover his composure. His face was still working nervously, however, when at length the detective turned and held out a pen towards him. "'Will you not write at once to General Tenby?' he suggested. Mark sat down before the blotting pad. "'He will be at home,' he said mechanically. "'This weather will have driven them in early if they have been shooting.' The note was written and dispatched by a groom on horseback, and then Gimlet bade an revoir to his host at the door of the castle. I will go back to the cottage, he said. I have an accumulation of correspondence that absolutely must be attended to, and I do not think there is anything to be done up here before General Tenby comes. Once we have the Nihilist papers in our hands, 
I have a little plan by which I think our birds may be trapped. Will you meet me at the cottage at half-past six? The general will have to pass it on the way to Inverashiel, and we can stop him as he goes by. It will be about seven o'clock, I expect, said Mark, when he gets down from Glenliquit. I'll be with you before he is. The Lord knows how I shall get through the time till he comes. I loathe writing letters, but this afternoon I am dashed if I don't almost envy you and your correspondence. I know it is the waiting that tells on one, Gimlet said, his voice full of kindly sympathy. What you want is to get right away from this place. Its associations must be horrible to you. No one could really be astonished if you never set foot in it again. Mark laughed rather bitterly. That's just what I feel like, he said shortly. My uncle killed, my cousin arrested, my friend accused, Miss Byrne refusing to let me behave decently to her about the money. Oh, well, he pulled himself up and spoke in a more guarded tone. One gets used to everything in time, no doubt. But just at present, I'm afraid, I am rather depressing company. See you later. They went their ways, Gimlet going forth into the drenching rain, which was now falling down the road through the soaking woodlands to the cottage, where the Cryan and policemen still smoked their pipes undisturbed. Lady Ruth met him at the gate, running down in her waterproof when she saw him approaching. "'Where is Juliet?' she cried. "'Wasn't she at Inverashiel?' "'Hasn't she come back?' asked Gimlet, answering her question by another. "'No sign of her. What can have happened?' "'Mr. Gimlet, I am really getting dreadfully anxious. She must have gone on to the hills and lost her way in the mist.' "'She is sure to get back in time,' Gimlet tried to reassure her, though he himself was beginning to wonder at the girl's absence. Perhaps, he added, she is at Mrs. Clutsam's. I dare say that's the truth of it. She can't be there, Lady Ruth answered. Mrs. Clutsam told me she was going out all day today to visit her husband's sister, who is staying somewhere twenty miles from here on the Oban Road, and longing, of course, to hear all about the murder at first hand. Relations are so exacting, and if they are relations in law, they become positive Shylocks. Juliet may have gone to the lodge, though, all the same, and stayed to keep the Romaninoff girl company. She seemed to be satisfied with this explanation, and Gimlet had tea with her, and then went to write his letters. Soon after six one of the policemen went down to the high road to lie in wait for General Tenby, and about twenty minutes past the hour wheels rattled on the gravel of the short carriage drive, and the General drove up to the door. He was a tall, soldierly-looking man, of between fifty and sixty, with a red face and a keen blue eye, and a precise, jerky manner. "'Ah, Lady Ruth, glad to see you bearing up so well under these tragic circumstances,' he said, shaking hands with that lady who came to the door to welcome him. "'Poor Ashel ought to have had shutters to his windows. Dreadful mistake, no shutters. Let's in draughts and coals in the head, if nothing worse.' These old houses are all the same, no safety in them from anything. Young McConachan wrote me an urgent note to come over. Don't quite see what for, but here I am. Eh? What do you say? Oh, detective from London, is it? How do you do? Perhaps you can tell me what the program is. Young Lord Ashel promised to meet us here at half-past six, Gimlet told him. We expect to put our hands on some important documents, and I was anxious you should be present. Quite unnecessary. Absolutely ridiculous. Still, here I am. May as well come along. The general went on talking to Lady Ruth, but after a few minutes the inspector from Cryannon sent in to ask if he could speak to him, and they retired together to Lady Ruth's little private sitting-room, where they remained closeted for some time. While the old soldier was listening to what the policeman had to tell him, Gimlet began to show signs of restlessness. He went to the door and looked about him. The weather was clearing, the clouds breaking and scudding fast before a wind which had arisen in the north. A tinge of blue showed here and there in the interstices between them, while a veil of mist that trailed after them shone faintly orange in the rays of the hidden sun. Gimlet went back and sat down in the drawing-room with the Scotsman in his hand. 
He put it down after a few minutes, however, and began fidgeting about the room. Then he went and conferred with the second of the two policemen, and as he was talking to him, the general and the inspector reappeared. "'I think,' said Gimlet, coming towards them, "'that we will not wait any longer for Lord Ashel. General Tenby, staring at him with rather a strange expression, nevertheless silently assented, and the four men started on their walk to the greenway. As they went up the glen, a ray of sunshine emerged from between the flying clouds and fell upon the statue at the end of the enclosed glade. Away to the right their eyes could follow the track of a distant shower, and as they went a rainbow curved across the sky, stretching from hill to hill, like some great monumental arch set up for the celestial armies to march under on their return from the conquest of the earth. That statue, Gimlet remarked to the general who walked beside him, is a specimen of the worst modern Italian sculpture. The figure of Pandora is modeled like a sack of potatoes. The composition is weak and unsatisfactory, and the pediment on which the whole group is poised large enough to support three others of the same size. The general grunted. I always understood that the late Lord Ashel knew what he was about, he said stiffly. He told me himself that it cost him a great deal of money. Gimlet sighed. He could not help feeling that it was a pity Lord Ashel had not earlier fallen into the habit of consulting him. Still, he was bound to admit that though the stone group regarded as a work of art, was altogether deplorable. The general effect of the erection in its rectangular setting of the forest was excellent. The whole scene was one of peaceful and romantic beauty. Poets might have sat themselves down in that moist and shining spot, and forgetful of the possibilities of rheumatism, found their muse inspiring beyond the ordinary. Gimlet was at heart something of a poet, but he felt no inclination to communicate the feelings which the place and hour aroused in him to any of his companions, and it was in a silence which had in it something dimly foreboding that the party drew near to the statue. In silence Gimlet approached the great block of stone and laid his hand upon the projecting horn of the bull. Equally silently the two policemen had taken up positions at the end of the pedestal. The general stood behind them, alert and interested. After a swift glance which took in all these details, Gimlet turned the horn round in its socket. The hidden door swung open, and there was a sound of muttered exclamations from the police, and a loud oath from the general. Gimlet sprang around the corner of the pedestal, and there, as he expected, cowering in the mouth of the disclosed cavity, and looking in his fury of fear and mortification, for all the world like some trapped vermin, crouched Lord Ashel glaring at his liberators with a rage that was hardly sane. Beyond him, on the floor at the back, they could see the tin dispatch-box standing open and empty. The two policemen, acting on instructions previously given them, made one simultaneous grab at the young man, and dragged him into the open with several seconds to spare before the door slammed to again, in obedience to the invisible mechanism that controlled it. They set him on his legs on the wet turf, and stood, one on each side of him, a retaining hand still resting on either arm. For a moment Mark gazed from the general to the detective, his eyes full of hatred. Then he controlled himself with an effort, and when he spoke it was with a forced lightness of manner. "'I have to thank you for letting me out,' he said. "'The air in there was getting terrible.' He paused, and filled his lungs ostentatiously but no one answered him. Losing something of his assumed calmness, he went on uneasily. I just thought I'd come along and see if there was any truth in Mr. Gimlet's story, and I was quite right to doubt it, since there isn't. He's not quite as clever as he thinks, for he was as positive as you like that my uncle's will was hidden here. But as a matter of fact, it's not, as I was taking the trouble to make sure when that cursed statue shut me in. There's nothing in it, of any sort, except an empty tin box. There's nothing in it now, said Gimlet, speaking for the first time, because I had no doubt you meant to destroy the will if you found it, so I moved it to a safe place last night. As for the other papers, I have sent them to London, where they will be still safer. I knew you would give yourself away by coming here, 
That's why I told you the secret of the bull's horn. Mark's face was dreadful to see. He made a menacing step forward, as if he would throw himself upon the detective. But the strong right hands of Inspector Cameron and Police Constable Fraser tightened on his arms and restrained his further action. He seemed, for the first time, to be conscious of their presence. "'Leave go of my arm!' he shouted. "'What the devil do you mean by putting your dirty hands on me?' "'My lord,' said the inspector, "'you had better come quietly. "'I am here to arrest you for the murder of your uncle, Lord Ashel, "'and I warn you that anything you say may be used against you.' "'Are you going to arrest the whole family?' scoffed Mark. "'Where's your warrant, man?' "'I have it here, my lord,' replied the inspector fumbling in his pocket for the paper the astonished general had signed when the inspector had imparted to him in lady ruth's little sitting-room the information he had received from mr gimlet as inspector cameron fumbled the young man with a sudden jerk which found them unprepared threw off the hold upon his arms and leaped aside as he did so he plunged his hand into his pocket and drew forth a little vial you shall never take me alive he cried and lifted it to his lips stop him shouted gimlet throwing his whole weight upon the uplifted arm he forced the file away from mark's already open mouth the other men rushed to his assistance and between them the frustrated would-be suicide was overpowered and held firmly while the inspector fastened a pair of handcuffs over his wrists when it was done he raised his pinioned hands as well as he could and shook them furiously at gimlet it's you i have to thank for this he shouted curse you you eavesdropping spy but there are surprises in store for you my friend you've got me it seems and you say you've got the will you'll find it more difficult to lay your hands on the heiress the words and still more the triumphant tone in which they were uttered cast a chill upon them all what do you mean cried gimblet but not another syllable could be got out of the prisoner and the inspector besides protested against questions being addressed to him with all the elation over his capture taken out of him and with a mind full of brooding anxiety gimlet hurried on ahead of the returning party and burst in upon lady ruth with eager inquiries but juliet had not returned how was any one to know that she had that morning made her way into the secret passage of the old tower and watched through the slip of glass in the case of the clock what julia romanoff was doing in the library but leaving gimlet and lady ruth to organize a search for her we will return to juliet in her hiding-place and see what was the end of her adventure end of chapter eighteen chapter nineteen of the ashel mystery this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Don W. Jenkins. The Ashel Mystery by Mrs. Charles Bryce. Chapter 19. When Juliet incensed and indignant at the russian's behavior discovered the door in the clock and was on the point of opening it and making her presence known a noise of steps in the passage made her pause as she listened there was the sound of a key turning in the lock the library door was thrown suddenly open and mark stepped into the room juliet saw julia's expression as she sprang round to face the newcomer she saw it change swift as lightning from a look of horrified dismay to one of sudden transforming tenderness as the girl recognized the intruder that the hand already in the act of pushing open the door of the clock fell inert and limped to her side and if she had been able to move she would have lost no time in retreating she knew instinctively that she was seeing a secret laid bare which she had no right to spy upon and yet though her impulse was to fly from the place in embarrassment and confusion something stronger than her natural discretion and delicacy held her where she stood for julia had not come here for the purpose of meeting mark she had come with a purpose less personal 
something juliet felt convinced that was in some way vaguely discreditable and at the same time menacing it could be for no harmless reason that she had taken this secret dangerous way into the castle and so juliet kept her ground blushing at her role of spy and averting her eyes as julia dropped the book she was holding and ran forward to meet mark with that tell-tale look upon her face but mark did not show the same pleasure he stood holding the handle of the door which he had closed gently behind him and looking with a certain sternness at the girl julia he said you here what are you doing oh mark she cried not answering his question aren't you glad to see me it is so long oh it is so long since i saw you she threw her arms round his neck with a happy laugh and drew his face down to hers darling darling she murmured how can we live without each other for one single day she spoke in a low soft voice to juliet to whom every purling syllable was painfully audible it sounded cooingly like the voice of doves to the surprise of the girl to whom mark had proposed marriage two days before when she ventured to peep through her spy window mark's arms were round julia and he was kissing her ardently but after a moment he released himself gently you haven't told me dear he said what you are doing here his voice held a note of authority before which julia's assurance vanished i-i wasn't doing anything she muttered julia he remonstrated well she said with some show of defiance i suppose anyone may take a book from the library of course he said you may take anything of mine you want still as you are not staying in the house in short it seems to me that the more obvious course would have been to have said something to me about it and besides he added struck by a sudden thought how in the world did you get in the door was locked and the key is on the outside oh if you're going to make such a fuss about nothing she exclaimed petulantly her toe beginning to tap the boards it's not worth explaining anything to you she turned away and walked toward the fireplace i'm not making a fuss mark said quietly but you must tell me julia what you are doing here and how you came to speak plainly i don't believe you came for a book if you don't believe me what's the good of my saying anything she retorted oh how horrid you are to-day mark i don't believe you love me a bit any more and leaning her head against the mantelpiece she burst into tears you know it isn't that julia he said looking at her fixedly don't cry there's a dear good girl you know that i love you why you're the only thing in the whole world that i really want but you must tell me how you came here tell me he repeated taking her hands from her face and forcing her to look at him what you want in the library tell me julia i want to know she seemed to struggle to keep silence but to be unable to resist his questioning eyes i suppose i must tell you she murmured it's not that i don't want to but they would kill me if they knew oh mark i ought not to tell you but how can i keep anything secret from my beloved swear to me that you will never repeat it or try to hinder me in what i have to do he bent and kissed her julia he said can't you trust me i do i do she cried while you love me i trust you but if you left off what then what is the nightmare that haunts me mark mark what would become of me if you were to change towards me he kissed her again murmuring reassuring words that did not reach juliet's ears so tell me now he ended what you were doing here mark she said nervously you know where my childhood was passed in st petersburg he replied wonderingly yes in petersburg and you know how things are there it is so different from your england my england for i am english really mark although that thought always seems so strange to me since during so many years i believed myself to be a russian i am the daughter of english parents my father was a very respectable london plumber of the name of hardston whose business went to the bad and who died leaving my mother to face ruin and starvation with a family of five small children of whom i was the last when a lady who took an interest in the parish in which we lived suggested that a friend of hers should adopt one of the children my mother was only too thankful to accept the proposal and i was the one from whom she chose to be parted i have never seen her since but she is still alive and i send her money from time to time the lady who adopted me was countess romaninov 
and I believed myself to be her child till a day or two before she died, when she told me, to my lasting regret, the true story of my origin. But I was brought up a Russian, and I shall never feel myself to be English. Somehow the soil you live on in your childhood seems to get into your bones, as you say here. It is true that I speak your language easily, but it was Russian that my baby lips first learned. My sympathies, my point of view, my friends, all except yourself, are Russian, and I have one essentially Russian attribute. I am a member of what you would call a nihilist society. Mark interrupted her with an interjection of surprise, but she nodded her head defiantly and continued, All my life, all my private ends and desires must be governed by the needs of my country. First and foremost I exist that the rule of the tyrant may be abolished, and the Slav be free to work out his own salvation. He shall be saved from the fate that now overwhelms and crushes him, dragged bodily from under the heel of the oppressor. I am not the only one. We are many who think as one mind, and the day is not far distant when our sacrifices shall bear fruit. Ah, Mark, what a great cause, what a noble purpose is this of ours! Perhaps I shall be able to convert you, to fire your cold British blood with my enthusiasm?" She stopped and looked at him inquiringly, but he made no reply, and after a moment she continued, placing her hand fondly upon his shoulder as she spoke. Our plan is to terrify the rulers into submission. We must not shrink from killing, and killing suddenly and unexpectedly, till they abandon the wickedness of their ways. They must never know what it is to feel safe, and we see to it that they do not. Death waits for them at the street corner, on their travels, at their own doorsteps. They never know at what moment the bomb may not be thrown, or the pistol fired. It is sad that explosives are so unreliable. There are many difficulties. You would not believe the obstacles that we find placed in our path at every turning. And for those who are suspected there is Siberia and the mines. But it is worth it. It is worth anything to feel that one is working and risking all for one's country and one's fellow countrymen. It is an honor to belong to a band of such noble men and women. But now and then one is admitted who turns out to be unworthy. Yes, even such a cause as ours has traitors to contend with and your uncle, Lord Ashel, was one of them. What? said Mark, incredulously. Uncle Douglas, a nihilist? Nonsense! It's impossible! He was, really, for he joined the Friends of Man when he was at the British Embassy at Petersburg long years ago, and no sooner had he been initiated than he turned round and denounced the society and all its works. Worse still, he declared his intention of hindering it from carrying out its programme. He would have been got rid of there and then, but as ill luck would have it, he had, by an unheard-of chain of accidents, become possessed of an important document belonging to the society. It was, indeed, a list of the principal people on the executive committee that fell into his hands, and he took the precaution of sending it to England, with instructions that if anything happened to him, it should be forwarded to the Russian police, before he made known his ridiculous objections to our programme. Here, as you will understand, was a most imposing situation with which there was apparently no means of coping. For years that one man hampered and frustrated our entire organization. He was practically able to dictate his own terms, for he announced his intention of publishing the list of names if we carried out any important project, and no device could be contrived to stop his being as good as his word. The tyrant has walked unscathed except by mere private enterprise, and the government we could have caused to crumble to the ground has flourished and continued to work evil as before. We have been crippled, paralyzed in every direction. It was only last year that there seemed reason to think that Lord Ashel had removed the document from the Bank of England, where it had for so long been guarded, and there appeared to be a possibility that he now kept it in his own house. If that were so, there seemed a good chance of getting hold of it, and how proud I am, Mark, to think that it was I who was chosen to make the attempt. I came to England with the best introductions into society, and had no difficulty in making friends with your aunt and obtaining an invitation to stay here. Last year I did not succeed in gaining any information. Your uncle, for some reason, seemed rather to avoid me, and I did not make any headway toward gaining his confidence. I never could be sure if he suspected me. This year there was a question of replacing me by someone else, but it was judged that Lord Ashel's suspicions would be certainly awakened by the appearance of another Russian, so in the hope that I was not associated in his mind with the people to which he had behaved so basely, I was ordered to try again. 
a member of the society who occupies a high and responsible position on the council accompanied me to the neighbourhood and from time to time i report to him and receive his advice and instructions he stays in crianan so that i have someone within reach to go to for advice at least so i am officially informed but i know very well he is really there to keep watch on me for it is not the habit of the society to trust its members more than is unavoidable if it is possible i go once a week to crianan and make my report but i can't always manage to go and then he rows across the loch after dark and i go out and meet him he was to come on the night of the murder and my first thought when i heard of it was that he might be caught in the shrubberies and mistaken for the murderer but it appears that he had already taken alarm and i am thankful to say he was able to escape in good time so did david really see someone wandering about that night mark commented thoughtfully ah julia if you'd told me all this earlier everything might have been different poor old david never need have been dragged into it at all she looked at him a moment as if puzzled then continued her story it was thought that i might be able to bring about your uncle's death by some means that should have all the appearance of an accident and so perhaps not involve action on the part of those who hold the document that is if it should prove not to be in his own keeping for he had always assured the council that no decisive step would be taken except as a retort to signs of violence on our part whether directed toward himself or others i have not been able to find any trace of the list i thought i had it one day in london when i followed lord ashiel to a detective's office and managed to gain possession of an envelope given him by lord ashiel but as far as i could make out it contained nothing of any importance it was a bitter disappointment you can imagine the consternation into which we were thrown by the murder it seemed certain that his death would be attributed to our organization and if anyone held the list for him it would be published immediately four days have passed however and my superior has received a cable saying that so far all is well it looks more and more as if the list had been kept here but i have hunted everywhere and found nothing oh i have searched without ceasing since the moment i heard of his death i came here even on the very night of the murder and moved the body with my own hands in order to get at the bureau drawers there is a secret way into the room through that old clock there which leads into the grounds i found it long ago one day when i was exploring outside in the shrubberies i have often been here and searched and searched again do you know anything of this document mark if you do i beg and implore you to give it to me otherwise i cannot answer for your life and as for our marriage that is out of the question unless i am successful in my undertaking it may be imagined with what amazement and growing horror juliet listened to this avowal that julia the girl with whom she had associated on terms of easy familiarity which had been near to becoming something like intimacy in the close contact and companionship of a country house life that this girl an honoured guest in lord ashiel's house should have gained her footing there for her own treacherous ends or at the bidding of a band of political assassins juliet could scarcely believe her ears as she heard the calm indifferent tone in which julia spoke of the drawbacks to getting rid of lord ashiel and of the contemplated accident which was to have befallen him she would have fled from where she stood if mingled fear and curiosity to hear more had not rooted her to the spot her alarm was tempered by the presence of mark if this girl should discover her hiding there and show signs of the violence that might be expected from such a character mark would be there to protect her she could trust him to know how to deal with the russian whose true nature must now be apparent to him but mark to her astonishment had not drawn away from julia with the repugnance and disgust that were to be expected instead he was looking at her strangely indeed but almost eagerly it was you then who moved the body to think that i never guessed he murmured half to himself if i had known i might have spared myself the trouble to then more loudly he reproached his companion and you have never said a word to me oh julia you didn't trust me he shook his head at her mournfully trust you she retorted did you trust me but i would have trusted you she added gazing fondly into his eyes if i had dared risk the punishment that will surely be meted out to me if it is known i have done so you don't know how rigid the rules of our society are but you haven't told me yet if you have the list not i he said i never heard of its existence i suppose that anonymous letter that came addressed to uncle douglas after his death had something to do with that did a letter come from paris they sent them to him from time to time it prevented his suspecting me but you will give me the list if you find it won't you it means everything to me of course i will he promised 
it is no earthly good to me so far as i know but you when you were looking for it did you among all the papers you examined ever come across such a thing as a will no never she replied mrs clutsam told me it could not be found you may be sure if i had discovered one which did not leave you everything i should have destroyed it dear little julia mark drew her to him and kissed her how sweet you are there is no one like you really do you really love me mark darling of course i do will you always are you quite quite sure that i am the one girl in all the world for you as you are the one man for me darling you are the only one in the world i have ever so much as looked at would you never never forget me or marry anyone else no matter what happened never he assured her never she sighed contentedly what should i do if you forgot me mark i should die but she added in a different tone i think i should kill you first mark laughed a little uneasily hush hush he said you mustn't talk so much about killing a minute ago you were talking of killing my poor old uncle if i took you seriously what should i think it is lucky i love you as i do otherwise doesn't it occur to you that it might get you into trouble to talk in this wild way you can take me as seriously as you like she answered gravely i am serious enough god knows but i shouldn't talk about it even to you if i didn't know it was safe you see i know you are like me like you i'm dashed if i am how do you mean i am like you she looked at him squarely and nodded yes she said you are like me you would not hesitate to kill if you thought it necessary you think just the same as me on that subject only you have gone farther than i have yet julia he cried what do you mean i mean that i know all about you mark she replied gravely i know what you think you have kept secret from me i know it was you who killed your uncle with a muffled cry mark shook himself free and sprang away from her what are you saying he whispered hoarsely you're a mad girl but i won't have such lies uttered i won't have it i tell you with terrified amazement juliet saw his face change become ugly distorted but julia showed no sign of alarm why get so excited she asked calmly what does it matter do you imagine i would betray you i who would sell my soul for you i know you did it it is no use keeping up this pretense of innocence to me who had more right to kill him than you why shouldn't you kill who you wish but don't you say you didn't do it it is foolish i saw you it is a lie you can't have seen me mark declared again but with less assurance you were in the drawing-room all the time lady ruth and maisie tarver both said so the drawing-room doesn't even look out on the garden there is no room that does except the library and you weren't there then anyhow i didn't see you fire the shot said julia but i saw you afterwards when you went to put your rifle back in the gun-room i told you that after the first search in the grounds was over and everyone had gone up to bed i slipped out of the house by the door near the gun-room and came round to the library to see if lord ashiel had carried the list on him when i came back i let myself in quietly by the door which i had left unbolted and had just got halfway up the back stairs when i heard footsteps in the passage below and crouched down behind the banisters i saw you come along the passage carrying an electric lantern in one hand and your rifle in the other i saw you look round anxiously before opening the gun-room door and going in when you had vanished i hurried on up to my room for it was not the time or place to tell you what i had seen but i left a crack of my door open and after a long while i saw you pass along the passage to your own room this time without your gun i knew of course that you had been cleaning it and putting it away she spoke with the indifference with which one may refer to a regrettable but uncontrovertible fact and mark seemed to feel it useless to deny what she said you had no right to spy on me he exclaimed angrily when she had done oh mark she cried dismayed i wasn't spying it was the merest accident and i think it's horrid of you to mind my knowing why didn't you tell me all about it before i might have helped you i'm sure but he would have none of her endearments and threw off the hand she laid upon his arm with a rough gesture mark oh mark she wailed don't be angry with me you know i can't bear it i can bear anything but that don't don't be angry with me she had but one thought it was for him and he who ran might read it shining in the depths of her great eyes after a few minutes of sulking mark relented no one can be angry with you for long julia he declared instantly she was once more all smiles don't ever be angry with me again she urged her hand in his and now that you have forgiven me tell me all about it what made you do such a dreadful thing mark 
he must have had some good reason i know i never would doubt that there is nothing much to tell he said unwillingly i had a good reason yes i must have money it is for your sake darling that i must get it i can't marry you without it i hadn't meant to kill him if i could get it without he was ill and had left his fortune to me i thought i should get it in time by letting nature take her course it was that or ruin and i really had to do it for your sake darling i didn't want to hurt the old boy why should i it's not a pleasant thing to have to do but i had no choice there was no other way of getting enough money and i simply had to get it it was his life or mine you don't understand i can't explain it just had to be done and there's an end of it everything was going wrong that girl that burn girl i imagine he was going to marry her you know we all did that would have spoiled everything at first i thought she could be got out of the way but she seemed to bear a charmed life what cried julia did you try to kill her too why if anyone had to be got rid of he admitted defiantly it seemed better to go for a stranger like her than for my own uncle come you must see that surely she was nothing to me and anyhow my hand was forced it's very hard that i should have been put in such a position i'm the last person to do harm to a fly but one must think of oneself since it was no use denying the murder he seemed to find some sort of satisfaction in telling julia of his other crimes and yet though he tried hard to speak with an affectation of indifference it was plain that he kept a watchful eye upon his listener and was ready to fasten resentfully upon the first sign of horror or even disapproval for all his efforts the tone of his disclosures was at once swaggering and suspicious but he need have had no anxiety as to the spirit in which they would be received it was clear that julia brought to his judgment no remembrance of ordinary human standards of conduct to her he was above such criticisms as the immortals might be supposed to be above the rules that applied to dwellers upon earth what he did was right in her eyes because he did it and she admired his brutality as she adored the rest of him whole-heartedly without reservation i had a shot at her he went on one day on the moor when she was with david but i missed her it was a rotten shot i can't think how i came to do it that's when she fell into the river i saw her standing by it as i came home from stocking i had walked on ahead and where the path runs along above the waterfall pool i happened to go to the edge and look over there she was on a stone right at the edge by the deepest part it looked as if she'd been put there on purpose and i should have been a fool to miss such a chance it's no good going against fate as a matter of fact i thought i'd got her sitting this time i caught up the nearest piece of rock and dropped it down on her that was a good shot though i say it but it hit her on the shoulder instead of the head as luck would have it which was bad luck for me however in she went and i thought all was well and lost no time in getting away from the place if it hadn't been for that meddling fool andy well then at dinner uncle douglas came out with the news that she was his daughter not his intended and everything looked worse than ever afterwards when she went to talk to him in the library and passed through the billiard room where i was knocking the balls about and feeling pretty savage i can tell you i happened by a fluke to ask her if she knew where david was she said he'd gone into the garden then i saw my chance and it seemed too good to miss why should i let my inheritance be stolen from me i ran off to the gun room for a gun i meant to take david's rifle but i found he hadn't cleaned it so i left it alone and took mine as the thing was really too important to risk using a strange gun unless it was absolutely necessary and his is a little shorter in the stock than i like i nipped back and let myself out of the passage door into the enclosed garden it was a black night though i knew my way blindfolded about there but the curtains of the library were drawn and i couldn't see between them without stepping on the flower bed I knew too much to leave my footmarks all over them, but I had to get on to the bed to have a chance of getting a shot, so I got the long plank the gardeners use to avoid stepping on the flower beds when they are bedding out from the tool house behind the holly hedge where I knew it was kept, and put it down near the hedge. It is held up clear of the ground by two cross pieces of wood, one at each end. You know, so there will be no marks left to identify me by. When I walked to the end of the plank, I could see straight into the middle of the room but they must have been sitting near the fire, for no one was in sight. I could see the writing bureau and the chair in front of it, and dimly in the back of the room I could make out the face of the clock, but that was all. Well, I stood there for what seemed a long while. You've no idea how cramping it is to stand on a narrow plank with no room to take a step forward or back for a long time, and I don't mind telling you I got a bit jumpy waiting there. If anyone chanced to come along, what could I say by way of explanation?' i couldn't think of anything the least likely to wash 
and somehow in the dark one begins to imagine things i saw david coming at me across the lawn every other minute and it seemed so hideously likely that he should come i knew he was somewhere out in the grounds by jove if he had he'd have got the bullet instead of uncle douglas but he didn't come those beastly shadows and shapes and whisperings and rustlings that seemed to be all around me hiding in the night turned out to be nothing after all but when i didn't fancy him at my elbow i imagined he was in the gun-room wondering where the dickens my rifle had got to oh i had a happy half-hour among the roses i tell you a rifle is a heavy thing too i leaned it up against a rose-bush and tried to sit down on the plank but it wouldn't do and i saw i must bear it standing or uncle douglas might cross in front of the slip between the curtains without my having time to get a shot you must remember i'd been on the hill all day so that i was very stiff to begin with it got so bad that i began to think it was hardly worth the candle at last and it's a wonder i didn't miss him clean when just as i was on the point of giving the whole thing up and going in again he came suddenly into my field of vision and actually sat down at the table i took a careful aim and fired i saw him fall forward and then i jumped off the plank and hurled it back under the hedge before i ran for the house i had left the door ajar and i just stayed close to it and then darted into the empty billiard room and thrust my rifle under a sofa it was a quick bit of work i had counted on juliet byrne waiting a moment or two to see if she could do anything to help him before she roused the house or it roused itself and she was rather longer than i expected i don't mind owning i got into a panic when minutes passed and no one appeared and i began to think i must have missed the old boy altogether i was within an ace of going to make certain when the door opened and in she came oh well you know all the rest that silly old ass david was still mooning about in the garden thinking of her i suppose which was very lucky for me julia had listened with absorbed interest i think it's wonderful she said that you should have gone through all that for my sake i shall always try to deserve it my dear was it all all for me that you did it truly yes mark assured her gruffly monosyllabic but how was it she asked caressingly that sir david's footprints were found all over the rose-bed what was he doing there that was an afterthought mark admitted it was a top-hole idea after everyone had gone upstairs i crept down and got my man liquor from where i had hidden it and took it to the gun-room where i cleaned it put it in its usual place it was lucky for me that david had left his weapon dirty it was jolly unlike him to do it i was thinking what a good thing it was and how well things looked like turning out for i thought i could manage the girl if she was able to prove that she really was a mcconachan and it struck me i ought to be able to contrive that the business should look a bit blacker against poor old david every one knew he'd had a row with uncle douglas about his beastly dog and if i could only manufacture a little more evidence against him i knew i should be pretty safe one way or another i was going back to the garden to put by the gardener's plank when i thought of using his boots it didn't take long to find them among all the boots used that day by the household which were ranged in a row in the place where they cleaned them in the back premises his bootmaker's name was in them i took them and when i got to the garden door i put them on and went out and trampled out among the roses till i was pretty sure that even the blindest country booby couldn't fail to notice the tracks i'd left though of course i couldn't see them myself in the dark then i got the plank out of the hedge and put it away where i'd found it after that i took the boots back and went to bed and very glad i was to get there now you've heard the whole story how clever you are murmured the girl there's no one like you she said no one mark smiled rather fatuously he evidently shared her opinion that his brains were something slightly out of the way and everything happened just as you'd planned she went on admiringly they suspected sir david from the first i should have myself if i hadn't known it was you who had done it yes said mark they suspected him the silly idiots they might have known he hasn't the initiative to do a thing like that and the girl can't prove her relationship to uncle douglas just as i expected i thought there might be some difficulty about that but i wish i could find the will he made in her favour i should feel safer then for she told me he said he'd worded it so that she should get the money whether she was proved his daughter or not and who knows what other mad clauses he may have put in it lately for some reason i could never make out i felt sure he had changed toward me he let fall a hint one day that his legacies to me were conditional on my good behaviour i don't feel easy about it at all someone must have been telling him things poisoning his mind but i've hunted high and low and found nothing i'm sick of looking over musty old bills oh we shall find it between us now said julia hopefully 
i wish i had some idea where the list i want is though she added there's that detective too pursued mark that fellow gimblet i'm rather fed up with him not that he seems any use at his work though he's supposed to be rather first class at it i believe gimblet is that who it is mrs clutsam told me a london detective was here but i didn't know who it was i have met him before and found him very easy to manage i don't think you need be afraid of anything he may do i shall be glad when he's off the place anyhow said mark i shall be glad when the whole business is over and forgotten julia rejoined i wish we could be married at once mark darling but why can't it be given out that we are engaged i don't understand why we should keep it a secret now i can't stand seeing so little of you as i have these last few days be patient darling wait just a little longer there are reasons as i have told you i must get my financial affairs straight for one thing before i allow you to tie yourself to me suppose i turn out to be a beggar i couldn't let you marry me then you know mark julia's voice was full of reproach you know perfectly well how little i care about your money i would be only too glad to marry you if you hadn't a penny but perhaps you mean that if you were poor you wouldn't want to burden yourself with a wife you know how i adore you julia how can you suggest such a thing i couldn't even dream of a life without you you show how little you know me but believe me it is wisest to wait a short time longer before we are publicly engaged you must take my word for it and not make me unhappy by imagining such cruel things come let us look for this list of yours what were you doing searching among the books yes said she rising as he went toward a bookshelf and following him i thought it might be hidden between the leaves of one of these old volumes one reads of such things i wonder he said absently the will too may be here is there a bible anywhere i believe that's a favourite place of concealment then when the heir is virtuous and reads his bible he gets the legacy you know while if he isn't he doesn't a sort of poetic justice is meted out if i find it in that way i shall take it as a sign that i am really the virtuous one and that heaven absolves me from all blame he spoke mockingly but julia answered very seriously of course you ought to have it and if i don't blame you why should any one else well he said after a pause at all events i mean to get it whether or no if i have to pull down every stone of the place that reminds me he added where is the secret entrance you used through this old clock who would have thought it in a moment juliet realized that she was going to be caught she had been so absorbed in listening to the dreadful revelations that had been made during the last half hour that not till now had she considered how dangerous was her position as he spoke mark threw open the door of the clock case too late she turned to fly he caught her by the arm and with a stifled oath dragged her into the room how long have you been there he cried and fell to swearing horribly while julia stood by not speaking but looking at juliet with an expression which frightened her more than all his violence End of chapter 19 Read by Don W. Jenkins Rancho San Diego, California Shaggybark.blogspot.com Chapter Twenty of the Ashel Mystery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mary Herndon Bell. The Ashel Mystery by Mrs. Charles Bryce. Chapter Twenty. It did not occur to Juliet to deny that she had overheard their talk she had been found in the act of spying on them and it was inconceivable that they should believe she had not done so besides she was raging at the thought of what she had heard and her anger gave her a courage she might otherwise have found it hard to maintain i have been here all the time she declared stoutly i heard all you said you wicked wicked man a murderer oh how horrible it all is julia laid a hand on mark's arm she will tell what she knows she said trembling she shall not mark stammered furiously he seemed to be half suffocating with rage she shall not go unless she swears to say nothing swear it i say he seized juliet by the shoulder and shook her violently to emphasize his words 
i won't swear anything of the kind she retorted trying to break from his grasp do you suppose you can kill me too without being found out there is a detective here now and sir david southern is not at hand to lay the blame on you coward how dare you touch me the truth of her words seemed to strike home to mark for he left go of her suddenly and stood biting his nails and scowling the picture of irresolution and malignance juliet lost no time in following up any advantage she might have gained i can't help knowing that you care for him she said addressing herself to julia though i wouldn't have listened to that part if i could have helped it but how can you how can you i can't understand how you can feel as you do about killing people but at least if you did such a thing you would imagine it was for the good of your country while this man thinks of nothing but his own selfish ends money that is all he wants how can you condone such a crime as his to kill lord ashiel that good kind man who had treated him like a son all his life who did everything for him and just for the sake of money it's not even as if he wanted it really he's not starving he had everything in reason that he wanted if he needed more urgently i believe he had only to tell his uncle and it would have been given to him oh it is beyond all words he must be a fiend indignation choked her she spoke in bursts of trembling anger her words sounding tamely in her own ears all she could say seemed commonplace and inadequate beside the knowledge that this man was her father's murderer even julia indifferent to every aspect of the case that did not touch upon her relations with her lover was shaken by the scornful disgust with which the broken sentences were poured forth and if her infatuation for mark was too complete to allow her to consider any action of his unjustifiable still she realized perhaps for the first time the feelings with which other people would view the thing that he had done you don't understand him she faltered he didn't want money for himself alone it was for me he did it he was too proud to ask me to marry a poor man you could never understand his love for me how can i blame him how many men would run such risks for the girl they loved i am proud yes proud to be loved like that you believe his lies juliet cried contemptuously you believe he loves you so much why it is not two days since he came to me and asked me to marry him what julia spoke in a panting whisper her face had suddenly lost every particle of color say it's not true she begged turning miserably to the man he made an effort to deny the charge of course not a word of truth in it damned nonsense he blustered but his eyes fell before juliet's scornful gaze and julia was not deceived it can't be true oh it can't she moaned no man could be so vile no other man could juliet amended in spite of herself she was sorry for the girl whose stricken face showed plainly the anguish she was undergoing forget him julia he is not worthy to tie your shoelace he came to me after they had taken david away and asked me first if i would take his inheritance even though i couldn't prove my birth which he must have known perfectly that i should never dream of doing and then proposed i should marry him saying that he was very fond of me and that in that way justice would be done as regards lord ashiel's money however things turned out for me i thought it was honourable and generous at the time and so did lady ruth when i told her oh yes she knows about it and can tell you it is true but now i see that all he wanted was to be on the safe side and if i had accepted him and had turned out to have no claim upon his uncle's fortune he would have broken the engagement on some easy pretext can you deny it she demanded of mark but he could not face her though he made an effort again to brazen it out every word she had spoken seemed to strike julia like a blow she shrank quivering away and threw herself down on to a chair her face hidden in her hands juliet went to her and touched her gently on the shoulder don't think of him any more she said 
presently you will hate yourself for having cared for a murderer just now i know your love for him makes you gloss over his crimes but when you are yourself you will see how odious they are poor julia i hate to hurt you so but it is better isn't it that you should know you will forget this madness he is not worth your wasting another thought on think how shamefully he has deceived you think of all his lying words of how he told you he had never looked at another woman julia raised her head and showed a face white as chalk in which the great brown eyes seemed to burn like fires of hatred yes she said in a hard even voice i am thinking of it i shall not forget him no instead i shall think of him day and night be sure of that i shall laugh as i think of him laugh at the thought of him in his place in the dock or in his prison cell i shall laugh when i give my evidence against him and most of all i shall laugh on the day when he is hanged if his grave is to be found i shall dance upon it oh it will be a merry day for me that day when the cord is tightened round his false neck she went near to mark and hissed the last words into his face leaning forward with one hand on her own throat but he seemed to shrink less before her vindictive passion than he had under the colder scorn of juliet's denunciations come juliet said julia calming herself a little although hate was still blazing in her eyes let us leave this place we must send for the police julia said mark stepping forward and speaking with some of his former assurance you condemn me unheard why should you believe this girl before me it is not like you julia it is not like the girl i love for i do love you darling in spite of what you may think and till a few moments ago i thought you loved me too but i see now what your love is one whiff of suspicion one word of accusation and without proof or evidence you condemn me and your so-called affection disappears julia i think you have broken my heart juliet gave vent to a derisive sound which can only be called a snort but it was plain that his words and more especially the manner of sad yet tender reproach in which they were uttered were not without their effect on the other girl her eyes wavered uneasily she twisted and tore at her handkerchief i have heard what you have to say she murmured i saw that you could not deny what juliet told me i did deny it but what is the use of talking to you when you are in such a state you are determined beforehand to disbelieve me and i have no wish to justify myself to miss byrne though i am willing to swallow my pride and do so to you Well she said after a moment's hesitation justify yourself if you can no one shall say i would not listen god knows i shall be glad enough if you can clear yourself to begin with said mark i admit that superficially there is truth in what you have heard but only superficially for the person i deceived was not yourself but this young lady i certainly as she suggests never had the slightest intention of marrying her for one thing i was absolutely certain she would refuse me but it seemed a good precautionary move to make what might appear a generous proposal and at the same time get a sort of mandate from the possible heiress herself to stick to my uncle's fortune you may be sure i should never have given it up in any case but it is as well to keep up appearances the business was only a move in the game i am playing and no more affects the sincerity of my love for you than any of the social equivocations we all find necessary from time to time i love you julia and you alone how can you doubt it i love you so much that i am willing to overlook your want of confidence in me and to forgive the cruel things you said just now darling how can i tell you before a third person what i feel for you you are everything to me and if you no longer love me i don't care what happens give me up to the police if you like the gallus is as good a place as another without your love long before he had finished all traces of resentment had vanished 
When he ceased speaking, she gave in completely, and threw herself upon his breast, sobbing passionately, and begging his forgiveness for having doubted him for an instant, while he soothed and comforted her in a low tone. Juliet did not know what to do or which way to look. The two stood between her and the door, and she felt an absurd awkwardness about trying to pass them. Was it likely she would be allowed to go out free to denounce them? She was afraid of trying. At last Julia was calm again, and there came a silence during which the pair glanced at Juliet, and then at each other. "'What's to be done?' Julia asked at length. And then suddenly, without waiting for an answer, "'I have an idea, Mark, that will save you. If her mouth can be stopped for a time, will you be able to get clear away?' "'I shall have to try, I suppose,' he replied, with a trace of his former sulkiness. "'To think that everything should miscarry because of a slip of a girl. "'You had better go to Glasgow and get on board some ship there "'which will take you to a place of safety. "'I shall have to stay behind till the matter of the list "'is settled one way or the other. "'But then, when I have reported to my superiors, "'I can join you, and we can begin life together in some far-off country. "'I shall be as happy in one place as in another with you, Mark, "'and you are sure you will be too with only me.' Mark hastened to reassure her on that point, but his tone as he said it did not carry conviction to Juliet. Julia, however, seemed satisfied. "'Miss Byrne can choose,' she continued. "'Either she swears not to say a word till we are both safely away, or else we can shut her in the dungeon of the castle. I know where it is, in the wall of this tower. She will never be found there, and I can take her food from time to time till I am ready to join you. "'Isn't that a good plan?' Mark considered. "'I don't think we will give her the option of swearing not to tell,' he said presently. "'As if I would ever promise such a thing,' Juliet interrupted, indignant. "'But,' he went on, ignoring this outburst, "'otherwise I think your idea is good. "'Where is this dungeon? "'We may be disturbed at any minute, and enough time has been wasted already.' "'I will go first and show the way,' said Julia. I have an electric torch, and she stepped into the clock and lowered herself through the trap door. Mark motioned to Juliet to follow. Ladies first, he said with a sneer. Juliet turned and made a dash for the door. I won't go, I won't, I won't, she cried desperately, though in her heart she knew she could not resist if he chose to use force. Perhaps if she screamed someone would hear. Oh, where was Gimlet? Why did he leave her to the mercy of these people? Help! Help! She lifted up her voice and shrieked as loud as she could. With a vicious scowl, Mark sprang upon her and clapped a hand over her mouth. Then, as she still continued to produce muffled sounds of distress, he stuffed his handkerchief in between her teeth and, lifting her bodily in his arms, thrust her before him into the clock and pushed her roughly down the hidden stair. Halfway down she lost her footing, and fell to the bottom where Julia was standing with her little lamp in her hand. Mark was following close behind, and between them they picked her up and hurried her, limping and bruised, along the narrow passage. She was allowed to take the handkerchief out of her mouth, for no cry could penetrate the immense thickness of these blocks of stone. At the point where there was a break to right and left in the walls of the passage, Julia came to a standstill. Here it is she said, turning her light on the opening in the wall on the left-hand side. The door is gone, so you will have to fetch something to block it up with. It seemed to be a small cell-like chamber built into the side of the tower. It may have contained a dozen cubic yards of space, and had neither door nor window. There are some slabs of stone at the end of the passage, said Julia. They are heavy, but you are strong. You will be able to bring them. We must leave a little space at the top of the door to admit some air, and for me to pass food through to our prisoner. She laughed with a feverish merriment. It will be like feeding the animals at the zoo, she said. Mark signified his approval by a nod. And is this the way? he asked, turning round and starting off in the opposite direction. No, no, Julia cried, laying a detaining hand upon his arm. I don't know what there is down there. I think it is a well. See, you are on the very edge. 
she cast the light onto a round dark opening in the ground some six feet in front of and below them from where they stood the floor began to slant suddenly and steeply downward so that if mark had taken another step it looked as if nothing could have prevented his sliding down into the gaping circle of blackness at the bottom julia shuddered violently oh she cried if you had gone over come away do come away it's a funny sort of well he says looks to me like something else did you ever hear of oubliettes julia juliet as she heard him grew white with terror julia julia she cried you won't let him throw me down there no no said julia he would not there is no reason mark she urged come away from here but he only laughed shortly don't be so hysterical he said and continued to bend his gaze upon the hole at the bottom of the slope it seemed to have a sort of fascination for him finally he picked a piece of loose mortar from the wall and threw it down into the gap a second later there was a dull sound which might have been a splash perhaps it is well after all did you think it sounded as if it had fallen into water yes said julia i am sure it did do come away i hate being here and indeed she was shivering from head to foot and not juliet herself seemed more anxious to leave the place just one more shot said mark here julia stoop down and roll that bit of stone slowly down the slope while i hold on to our prisoner we shall hear better that way give me your lamp anxious to satisfy him julia picked up the fragment he had knocked from the rough wall and stooping down stretched out her hand to set the stone in motion but as she did so mark loosened his grip on juliet and bending quickly behind this poor girl who loved him seized her by the shoulders and threw her forward on to her face the steep pitch of the floor finished what the impetus given by his onslaught had begun julia shot head first down the slope and disappeared into the black chasm of the well one long agonized scream came up to them out of the darkness and rolled its echoes through the lonely passages then the distant sound of a splash and silence back against the wall juliet cowered her whole body shaken by great sobs she was petrified with terror of this fiendish man but her fears for herself gave way before the horror of what she had seen oh what have you done what have you done she wept mark tried to summon up a jeering smile the lantern threw no light upon his white and twitching face you don't suppose i meant to let her go free after the taste she gave me of her temper he asked in a voice he could not keep from shaking a little do you suppose i like having to do these things you women have never the slightest sense of common justice the whole thing is perfectly beastly to me but how could i live with a girl who would be ready to threaten me with the gallus every time she got out of bed wrong foot first it's not fair to blame me for other people's faults he spoke querulously with the air of a much injured man though juliet was beyond any coherent reply he seemed afraid of meeting her eyes and looked resolutely away from her his glance shifting and wavering from the walls to the floor from the floor to the stones of the low roof up down and sideways but never resting on her at last as if drawn there irresistibly and against his will they fell once more on the dark circle of the mouth of the pit and he started back shuddering violently as if i hadn't enough to bear without being saddled with hideous memories for the rest of my life he cried with bitter irritability if you had an ounce of common fairness in your composition you would admit i could do no less why any day she might have got jealous or something and flown into a passion again and denounced me to the police besides i have no wish to be obliged to fly the country why should i she was the only person who knew the truth except you that is why you must follow her no no cried juliet despairingly but without avail for her feeble strength could offer him no effective opposition and he thrust her easily on to the slope she felt instinctively that at that angle the merest push would make her lose her balance 
and sank quickly to her knees, catching him round the ankle with one hand, and clinging desperately. He swore furiously, and bent down to unclasp her fingers from his leg. Then he flung her hand away from him, and cut off from all assistance, she began instantly to slide backwards, slowly but irresistibly. End of chapter 20《Chapter Twenty One of the Ashel Mystery》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mary Herndon Bell《The Ashel Mystery》by Mrs. Charles Bryce《Chapter Twenty One Juliet dug her nails into the cracks of the stone floor with all the energy of despair, but in a moment her feet were over the edge of the pit, and she was falling. Her fingers gripped the edge with a fierce tenacity, and for some minutes she hung there, minutes that seemed longer than all the rest of her life put together. And so she hung, her knees drawn up in a frantic effort to pull herself out of the depths, till her muscles refused any longer to contract and she felt herself gradually straightening out and growing, it seemed, heavier and heavier, till she knew that in one more second her fingers would slip from their hold and all would be over. But as she dropped into a straight position, and wearily abandoned her efforts to raise herself, one of her feet suddenly touched some firm substance beneath it. Something narrow it was, for the other foot as yet still hung in space but some blessed solid thing on which it was possible to stand, as with a feeling of thankfulness and relief such as she had never before experienced, she allowed her weight to rest on it, and found that it did not give. She felt a sharp blow on the knuckles of her left hand, which made her withdraw it quickly and lean against the wall to steady herself. Mark was throwing stones at her fingers to make her leave go sooner, Another missed her narrowly, and shot over her head. She drew down her right hand, and still leaning against the wall, felt about with her other foot for a support. She soon found it a little farther back, it seemed, than the first foothold. But more experimental investigation showed that it was really part of the same object. There appeared, indeed, to be several of them about, all near to the wall, so that it was plain that poor Julia, as she shot over the brink, had fallen outside and beyond them. What the bars were that she seemed to be standing on, Juliet could not at first imagine, and it was not till Mark, growing tired of waiting for a splash that never came, reached the conclusion that his ears had deceived him, and took himself and Julia's lantern off to other spheres of usefulness, that she perceived that a faint light penetrated into the upper part of the pit. When her eyes had become accustomed to it, she was able to make out that she was perched upon a portion of the roots of a tree which had grown in through holes in the wall. Three great roots there were, curling into and across the shaft of the pit, and disappearing down into the darkness below, where Juliet did not dare to look. She managed with great caution to stoop down and catch hold of the highest of the roots, and so to settle herself in a fairly comfortable position, sitting on the middle root of the three with her feet on the lowest, and her back against the top one. They might have been made on purpose, she told herself, her naturally high spirits and brave young optimism coming nobly to her rescue again. And she set herself to try and enlarge one of the holes in the wall, but she could not make much perceptible difference there. What it had taken centuries and the growth of a great tree to effect— could not be much improved on in an hour by one young girl, however strong the necessity that urged her. By the time she had exhausted her efforts, and must needs lean back and rest a while, the biggest hole was just wide enough to put her hand through, and she saw no prospect of enlarging it further. Through it she could see a corner of the lock, and the grey foot of Ben Gersey, but that was all. It showed, however, on which side of the tower she was, and she remembered the great beech that clung to the precipice below the place where the foundations of the castle sprang from the rock. At least she had always imagined it was below the foundations, but now she knew better. She thrust her hand out and waved it, 
but did not dare to leave it there. The terror Mark had instilled in her was too recent and too real. If she put out her hand, he would see it, and perhaps shoot it off, or at least know that he had failed to kill her as yet. Better he should think her dead like poor Julia. But was Julia really dead? She leant over and called down into the darkness. Julia! Julia! But no answer came, although she waited, holding her breath, and called again and again. Then she had fallen into the water? She must be drowned, even if the fall did not kill her. Poor misguided Julia! Better dead, after all, thought Juliet, with eyes full of tears, than alive and at the mercy of that terrible man. What disillusionments must have come to her sooner or later? Final disillusionings that could not be explained away. How horrible to find that the man you loved was like that. Nothing else in the world could be so appalling. Yes, Julia was better dead. As Juliet thought of the dreadful manner in which death had come to the unfortunate girl, she forgot her faults, forgot her strange views upon the justifiability of taking human life, forgot even that she had approved of Lord Ashiel's assassination, and contemplated bringing about his death herself, and remembered only the frightful nature of her punishment. And while she sat there clinging precariously to the twisted roots of the beech tree, Juliet's tears streamed down into the watery grave. Hours passed, and darkness fell upon the world without. In the patch of lock that was visible to her, she could see a star mirrored. It cheered her somehow. What there was comforting about it she could not have said, but in some way it seemed to be an emblem of her hopes. She wedged herself tightly between the roots, laid her head down upon the uppermost of them, and, such is the adaptability of youth and health, slept on her dangerous perch like a bird upon a bough. With the day she awoke, stiff and hungry, how long would it be before she was found? She felt braver under this new stimulus of hunger, and more ready to risk detection by Mark. After all, he could hardly get at her here, and someone else might see her if she signaled. She took off her shoes and stockings and pushed them through the hole in the wall, then her handkerchief, and finally the white blouse she wore was taken off and thrust out between the stones. She kept her hold upon one of the sleeves and wedged it down between the wall and the beech root, so that the blouse might hang out on the face of the rock like a flag and catch the attention of some passer-by. From time to time, too, she squeezed her hand through the gap and fluttered her fingers backward and forward. She knew that the path by the burn ran below, and it was used constantly by the gillies and by the household. Only, of course, so early in the morning there was not likely to be anyone about, and she remembered with a sinking heart that people seldom look up as they walk. Yet, in the course of the day, someone would surely see it. She sternly refused to allow herself to expect an immediate rescue. She would not, she told herself, begin to get really anxious about it till evening. It would be long to wait, of course, she looked at the little watch which Sir Arthur had given her on her last birthday. It was six o'clock. She must be patient. But in spite of all her forced cheerfulness, the time passed terribly slowly. She found an old letter in her pocket and a pencil with which she scrawled painstaking directions for her rescue. She would push it through the hole, she thought, if she heard any sound of voices above the clamor of the burn. After that there remained nothing more to do and the hours seemed to creep along more and more slowly, till each second seemed like a minute, and each minute an hour. She tried to divert herself by repeating poetry, and doing imaginary sums, and it was about eleven o'clock, when she was in the middle of the dates of the kings of England, that she heard Gimlet's voice hailing her in a shout from below. It was not till after her rescue, not till after she was given safely over to the affectionate ministrations of Lady Ruth, that Juliet gave way under the strain to which she had been subjected, and broke down altogether. Up till that moment the urgency of her own danger had prevented her from feeling, as acutely as she would have in other circumstances, the terrible fate of the Russian girl. But as soon as she herself was safe, the full horror of it settled upon her mind, till thought became an agony. She was shaken by alternate fits of shuddering and weeping, 
until Lady Ruth, who had a scathing contempt for doctors, was on the point of sending for one. The arrival of Sir Arthur, an hour or so after her release, did much to calm her. He had started post-haste from Belgium as soon as he heard of the tragedy, which was not till three days after it had occurred, and had spent the long journey in incessant self-reproach that he had ever allowed Juliet to go alone among these murderous strangers. The sight of his familiar face was full of comfort to the distracted girl, and the knowledge that Mark was arrested and powerless to harm her, with the gladsome news that David was free again, combined to soothe her nerves and restore her self-control. The fear of one cousin began to give place insensibly to the dread lest the other should find her red-eyed and woe-begone and soon the importance of looking her best when David should return occupied her mind almost to the exclusion of the terrors she had experienced. Thus does the emotion of love monopolize the attention of those it possesses, so that individuals may fall thick around him, and the surface of the earth be convulsed with the strife of nations, and still your lover will walk almost unconscious among such catastrophes, except in so much as they affect himself are the object of his affections but not yet was Juliet to see David. His mother's health had broken down under the distress and worry of the accusation brought against him, and it was to her side that he hurried as soon as he was released from prison. While Lady Ruth carried Juliet off at once to the cottage, there to be comforted, fed, made much of, and put to bed, Gimlet and the men who had assisted him in the work of rescue stayed behind in the walls of the tower, to rig up with ropes and buckets, an apparatus by which to descend to the lowest depth of the oubliette, where poor Julia's body must be lying. They had little hope of finding her alive, nor did they do so. She was floating face downwards in the water at the bottom of the pit. In a grim, wrathful silence the men raised the poor, lifeless body, and with some difficulty brought it back to the light of day. When the gruesome business was done, Gimlet returned to the cottage, tired out with his night's work, for, like all the men on the place, he had been scouring the moors since the previous evening, when Mark's derisive words had first sent them hotfoot to assure themselves of Juliet's whereabouts. As he reached the cottage, the daily post-bag was being handed in, and among his letters was one from the colonel of Mark's regiment. "'My dear sir,' it ran, I have sent you a wire in answer to your letter received to-day, since in view of what you say I see that it is necessary to disclose what I hoped, for the sake of the regiment, to continue to keep secret. But, if, as you tell me, the innocence and even the life of Sir David Southern is involved, and you have good reason to consider McConachan the man guilty of his uncle's death, it becomes my duty to put aside my private feelings, and confess to you, that I am unable to look upon Mark McConachan as entirely above suspicion. When he was a subaltern in the regiment I have the honor to command, he was a source of grave worry and trouble to me. From the day he joined I had misgivings, and though his good looks, lively spirits, and recklessness with money made him popular with others of his age, I soon discovered that his moral sense was practically non-existent and considered him a very undesirable addition to our ranks. Still, I hoped he might improve, and for a year or two nothing occurred to force me to take serious notice of his behavior. Unknown to me, however, he took to gambling very heavily, and must have lost a great deal more than he could afford, for he appears to have got deep in the clutches of money-lenders long before I heard anything about it. So desperate did his financial affairs become, that shortly before he left the regiment he was actually driven to forging the name of a brother officer, a rich young man with whom he was on very friendly terms. The large amount for which the check was drawn drew the attention of the bankers to it, and in spite of the extreme skill with which, I am told, the signature had been counterfeited, the forgery was detected, and the matter was brought before me. The victim of this fraud was as anxious as myself to avoid a public scandal and it was arranged that nothing should be done for a year to give time to McConachan to refund the money. If, however, he failed to do so within that time, there would be nothing for it but to make the matter public. These terms were agreed on, and McConachan was told to send in his papers at once. 
the year allowed is now drawing to a close and the money has not been forthcoming so there is no doubt that mark mcconachan's need of obtaining a large amount is extremely pressing my knowledge of his character obliges me to add that i consider him one of the few men i ever knew whom i could imagine going to almost any length to provide himself with what he so urgently requires please consider this letter confidential unless you obtain actual proof of his guilt i am sir yours faithfully t g ersford colonel commanding thirty first lancers gimlet put the letter away with the other items of evidence of mark's guilt the telegram from the analyst in edinburgh the measurements of the footprints on the rose-bed and of those other marks near the hedge by which he had first been mystified it was another thread in the thin cord that like the silken line ariadne gave to theseus had led him to come successfully out of the bewildering labyrinth into which the investigation of the crime had beguiled him End of chapter twenty one chapter twenty two of the ashel mystery this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mary Herndon Bell. The Ashel Mystery by Mrs. Charles Bryce. Chapter 22. It was after dinner that night, as he sat in the little drawing room of the cottage with Lady Ruth and Sir Arthur, that his hostess asked him to explain to them how he had contrived to detect the way in which the murder had been committed. "'You promised to tell me all about it,' Lady Ruth reminded him, "'if I would keep silent about your finding the papers in the statue. "'Tell us the whole thing from the beginning,' Sir Arthur urged him. "'I will willingly tell you anything that may interest you,' Gimlet consented readily. "'Everyone enjoys talking about their work to sympathetic listeners such as yourselves.' it is a bad thing to start on a case with a preconceived idea and i can't deny that when i first came here i was very near having an e-day fix as to the origin of the crime i tried to deceive myself into thinking that i kept an open mind on the subject but i don't think i ever really doubted for a minute that the nihilist society to which lord ashiel had formerly belonged was responsible for the murder even after my conversation with the new peer which showed me that things looked blacker against sir david southern than i had expected i was far from convinced that he was guilty though i was obliged to admit that there was some ground for the conclusion come to by the police but what was the evidence against him sir david was known to have quarrelled with his uncle he had even been heard to say that he had a good mind to shoot him but that was more than twenty-four hours previous to the crime, and the words were uttered in a moment of anger when he probably said the first thing that came into his head. Was he likely to have hugged his rage in silence for the hours that followed, and then to have walked out into the garden and shot his uncle in cold blood and without further warning? It did not appear to me probable, but then I did not know the young man he was not to be found when the deed was discovered and a hunt instituted for the murderer well he had an answer to that which fitted in with my own theory he said he saw some one hanging about the grounds and went to look for him but it was said that the night was so dark as to make it improbable that any one should have been seen even if there had been any one to see that cut both ways to my mind for it would account for the intruder making his escape undiscovered then there was the matter of the rifle which he had told miss byrne he had cleaned that evening in which case it had certainly been fired since then he owned that he had locked it up and that the key never left his possession afterwards but now denied that he had told the young lady that he had cleaned it i asked young lord ashiel if he could put any possible interpretation on these facts except the one accepted by the police and he replied that he could not that for the first time made me wonder if he were really anxious to believe his cousin innocent for i could put quite different interpretations on them myself in the first place though it was possible that sir david lied in making his second statement to the effect that he had not said he had cleaned his rifle 
it was equally possible that the first statement that he had cleaned it was not strictly accurate for some reason which he did not care to divulge he might have told miss byrne he had been cleaning his gun when he had been really doing something entirely different but had he told her he had cleaned it his words as repeated by her to me were i went in there to clean my rifle but not i have been cleaning my rifle which would be another thing altogether he probably had not yet begun cleaning it when he heard miss byrne coming and went out to speak to her it is possible some feeling akin to shyness might have made him reluctant to confess this afterwards in public indeed i now feel quite sure that this is the explanation of the matter later on when i questioned her again she did not appear certain which of the two forms of words he had used but there was at all events a considerable doubt there were other possibilities also someone might possess a duplicate key to the gun cabinet it seemed to me impossible that none of these considerations should have occurred to young ashel if he were really reluctant to believe in sir david's guilt but at the same time i remembered the almost incredible lack of reasoning powers shown by most members of the public where a deed of violence has been committed and knowing that there is nothing so improbable that it will not find a host of ready believers i did not attach much importance to the circumstance until later still on the whole after talking to young lord ashiel i felt more disposed to believe that there might be some truth in the accusation that had been made than i had previously thought likely but on that point i reserved my opinion till i should have had an opportunity of examining the scene of the tragedy for myself so i prevailed upon the new owner of the castle to leave me alone which he was more ready to do since he had urgent need to be first in examining some papers of his uncle's which were in another room and proceeded to make a cast round the garden from which the shot had been fired in the hope of lighting upon some trifle which had escaped the notice of macross it was when i came across the footprints in the rose-bed which had done so much to prove the guilt of sir david southern in the eyes of his accusers that i began to be certain of his innocence and a very little examination convinced me absolutely that whoever had shot lord ashiel it was not his youngest nephew for the tracks on the flower-bed left no room for doubt it is true they corresponded exactly with the shooting boots sir david had been wearing on the day the crime was committed i had provided myself with a pair that i was assured was exactly like those particular boots which fitted the tracks and which the police had taken away with them and i found that there was indeed no difference except for the matter of an extra nail or two on the soles there was no doubt that sir david's boots had made those impressions but to my mind there was equally no doubt that sir david had not been in them when they made them for the track which was so plainly distinguishable on the soft mould of the flower-bed had certain peculiarities which i could hardly overlook there was first a row of footmarks leading from the lawn to the middle of the bed then more marks as if the wearer of the boots had moved from one position to another hard by and finally a track leading back again to the mossy lawn at the side now all this was well enough till it came to the last row of footsteps those which led off the bed and which had presumably been taken after the fatal shot was fired but was it conceivable that a man who had that moment committed a cold-blooded murder should leave the scene of his crime with the same slow deliberate footsteps with which he had approached it surely not and yet this is what the wearer of the boots had done the imprints as they advanced towards the lawn were deep and well defined from toe to heel not only that but they were if anything closer together than those which preceded them now a man running leaves a deeper impression of his toe than he does of his heel and his steps are much farther apart in proportion to his increase in speed i myself ran from the middle of the bed to the lawn alongside of the footmarks of the soi disant murderer and though i am a short man while sir david's legs are reported long i left only two footprints to his five to me it was as certain as if i had seen it happen that the wearer of the boots trampled his way off the rose-bed as slowly as he had trampled on those footprints had been made by some one who was determined they should be seen not by some one whose only thought was to get away from the place 
not, in short, by a man who had that moment fired a murderous shot through the darkness. The tracks had undoubtedly been made as a blind, and with the intention of diverting suspicion to the wrong man, probably after the deed itself was done. I was satisfied, then, that the shot had not been fired from this particular part of the rose-bed, and I proceeded to search for other footprints farther down the bed. I did not feel much hope of being successful, since if our man had had the forethought to leave so many traces of someone else's presence, it was unlikely he would have neglected to ensure that his own should be absent. And, as I expected, I found none. But at the end of the garden, where it is bounded by the holly hedge, I came across something which puzzled me. There were two narrow depressions on the flower bed, about an inch wide by less than a foot long. They were parallel to each other, and at right angles to the hedge, and separated by a distance of six or seven feet. Near one, which was almost in the middle of the bed, was another mark, which I could not understand. It was only a few inches long, and in shape a narrow oval. I could not at first imagine what any of them represented, and it was only quite suddenly, as I was giving it up and going away, that the truth flashed across my mind. I had been looking regretfully at the track I myself had left by the side of the hedge on my way to and from the middle of the bed. What I want, I said to myself, is one of those planks raised off the ground by two little supports, one at each end, that gardeners use to avoid stepping on the beds when they are going through the process of bedding out. And even as I said it, I realized that the same idea had occurred to someone else, and that the marks I had been examining might have been made by just such a contrivance as the one I was thinking of. A short search showed me the plank itself, kept in a tool-house conveniently near the spot, and with a rake taken from the same place, I seized the opportunity of raking out my own footprints from the rose-bed. And now, who could this be who had so carefully manufactured a false scent, and so cleverly avoided being himself suspected? My previous theory that some envoy of the nihilist had been lurking in the neighborhood seemed not to meet the new conditions. For how could a mere stranger have gained possession of the misleading boots, or how returned them to their proper place? And how, for that matter, could a stranger have obtained the use of Sir David's rifle, if his rifle had indeed been used? That brought me to consider again whether, after all, there was any proof that his rifle had been used by any one. Supposing, as I saw no reason to doubt, he spoke the truth when he said that Miss Byrne had misunderstood him, and that he had not cleaned the weapon since coming in from stalking, was I driven back on the theory that someone possessed a duplicate key to the case where the guns were kept? not in the least. The shot might have been fired from a rifle that had never, at any time, been within the walls of the castle. Certainly the bullet fitted Sir David's Munlicher rifle, but that, as young Lord Ashell said himself, was equally true of his own rifle, or probably of a dozen others in the neighboring forests, since a sporting Munlicher is a weapon in common use in the highlands. The shot, then, might well have been fired by my hypothetical Russian, as far as the rifle was concerned. But he would have found it difficult to borrow Sir David's boots, and it seemed unlikely that any stranger would not only have dared to do so, but afterwards have had the audacity to return them. No, on the whole the footmarks seemed to clear the character of the Russian nation from any reasonable suspicion of being directly concerned in the crime. And yet, in spite of reason, I could not help feeling that the society of the friends of man must be at the bottom of the whole thing in some way I had not yet fathomed. I made every inquiry as to whether any foreigner had visited the castle, or been seen in the neighborhood, but the only strangers among the visitors had been Miss Julia Romaninoff and Miss Juliet Burns's French maid, both of whose alibis appeared so far unimpeachable. I had it on Lady Ruth's authority that Miss Romaninoff had been in the drawing-room with the other ladies at the time of the murder, and all the servants were at supper in the servants' hall. Otherwise I should have been inclined to look on Julia Romaninoff with a suspicious eye, as being the only Russian I knew to be on the spot. The last word the dying man had been able to pronounce, too, was, according to Miss Byrne, steps, 
which might very well have been intended for steps and have some connection with the enemies he dreaded with these considerations running in my mind i made my way to the gun-room not indeed with much expectation of its having anything to tell me but as part of the day's work of inspection which must not be shirked i took down young ashiel's rifle to examine he had told me it was of the same description as his cousin's and i was not very familiar with the make it was owing to my wish to see for myself with what kind of weapon the deed had been done that a very important clue fell into my hands as i put the rifle down on the bare deal table which forms the principal piece of furniture in the gun-room i saw a grain of something dark which looked like earth fall off the butt end on to the boards beneath i picked up the rifle and looked closely at the butt it was criss-crossed with small cuts as they sometimes are with the idea of preventing them from slipping and in the cuts some dust or earth seemed as i expected to be adhering i knocked the rifle upon the table and a little shower fell from it except for the first grain it might have been nothing but the ordinary dust of disuse but i could not help thinking it was of a darker hue than the accumulations of years generally take upon themselves and further i knew that the rifle had lately been used for stalking it was moreover specklessly clean in every other part i felt certain it had been leant upon the ground at no distant date and i remembered the mark i had not been able to account for at the foot of the rose-bush near the place where the plank had been used and as i was persuaded the cowardly shot actually fired if a gun had been linked against the large standard rose that grew there it would have left just such a mark upon the soft ground all this of course was a mere surmise and rather wild at that but the deer forests of scotland are not muddy whatever else they may be and i felt an unreasoning conviction that the rifle had not accumulated dust while engaged upon its legitimate business on the mountain tops the peaty moorland soil on which the castle stood would hardly be the best thing in the world for rose trees i imagined and it seemed not too much to hope that some other kind of earth might be artificially mingled with it i carefully collected the dust in a pill-box and promised myself to lose no time in obtaining the opinion of an expert analyst as to whether or no some trace of patent fertilizer or other chemical could not be traced in it it was now for the first time that suspicion of young lord ashiel began to oust my theory of the nihilist society's responsibility for the murder he had as i remembered struck me as taking his cousin's guilt for granted with somewhat unnecessary alacrity his rifle i already believed perhaps in my turn with needless alacrity had fired the fatal bullet and it seemed perfectly possible that it was his finger that pressed upon the trigger he was i knew in the billiard-room and alone both before and after the murder was committed it would have been quite easy for him to fetch his rifle place the gardener's plank in position fire his shot and return to the house provided Miss Byrne did not rush immediately from the room. He knew her to be a brave girl, and not likely to fly without making some attempt at offering assistance. But if she had rushed from the spot and met the murderer outside the library door, it would be simple enough to convey the impression that he had heard the shot, and that he was either dashing to their help or making for the garden in the attempt to catch the villain red-handed. The rifle was the only thing likely to provoke an awkward question but he could have dropped it in the dark and returned for it afterwards without much fear of detection as it happened he thought it safer to risk carrying it indoors and hid it under the billiard-room sofa till he had a chance to clean it and take it to the gun-room as we now know you can imagine the scene lord ashiel falling forward upon the writing-table under the light of the lamp the scoundrel leaping from his post upon the plank but not so quickly that he did not see the girl throw herself on her knees at the side of the fallen man i can fancy the frenzied haste with which mcconachan thrust the plank into the hedge and ran like a deer towards the door which he had no doubt left open i imagine him then tiptoeing to the door of the library and bending to listen every nerve a stretch what he heard no doubt reassured him it may have been the voice of the girl calling upon her father or it may have been the thud of her body falling upon the floor when she fainted perhaps even he might have stayed outside long enough to see her sink to the ground then he would steal back 
shut the door as gently as he had opened it, and not breathe again till he found himself in the empty billiard-room, his tell-tale rifle still in his hand. No doubt he wished he had left it in the hedge at that moment, for he must have opened the billiard-room door with most lively apprehensions. Supposing the shot had been heard and the household was rushing to the scene of the disaster? Suppose he opened the door to find the room full of people demanding an explanation of himself and his weapon? What explanation had he ready, I wonder? It must have taken all his nerve to turn the handle of the door. But no one can deny the man his full share of courage and decision. I felt more and more sure that in some such manner the crime had been gone about. And yet there were many complications, and more than once it seemed as if my convictions had been too hastily formed. Later that same afternoon I found, upon the sand of a little bay below the castle, marks that told me as plainly as they told one of the keepers who joined me there that a strange man had landed from a boat on the night of the murder, and even if our calculations were right, not far off the very hour in which the deed was done. From the tracks left by his boots, which were large and without nails, and extraordinarily pointed for those of a man, I felt sure that here one had landed who was no native of these parts, and the theory of the unknown Russian seemed to take on new life and vigor. The tracks, as we now know, were no doubt those of the member of the Society of the Friends of Man, who was living at Kryanin, and who hoped to have word with Julia Romanov. It was no doubt he whom Sir David saw lurking in the grounds, and it is natural to suppose that when he perceived himself to be observed, he retreated to his boat and made off, abandoning his proposed meeting for that night. I was to be further bewildered before my first day of investigation came to an end. Young Lord Ashel had spent the day in searching for the will, and if my inward certainty that he himself would prove to be the guilty man should turn out to be right, I could very well understand that he was anxious to find it. For from what his uncle had said to Miss Byrne, it seemed possible that he had so worded his last will and testament that whoever succeeded to the great fortune he had to bequeath it might not be Mark McConachan. But the will was not to be found, and there was no doubt to whose interest it was that it should never be found, so that I felt pretty sure that if the successor to the title were once able to lay his hands on it, no one else would ever do so. However, he had not found it yet, or the search would not be continued with such unmistakable ardor. Now I had a fancy myself to have a look for the will. I took the last words of the dead man to be an effort to indicate how I was to do so, and I had no idea of prosecuting my search under the eye of his nephew. Young Ashel was to dine at the cottage here with Lady Ruth, so I excused myself under pretense of a headache from appearing at dinner, and hurried back to the castle as soon as I could do so unobserved. I got in by a window which I had purposely left open, and made my way to the library. The words that Lord Ashel, as he lay dying, had managed to stammer out to his daughter, were only five. Gimlet, the clock, eleven, steps. I had decided to take the clock in the library as the starting point of investigation. He might, of course, have referred to any other clock, but only one could be dealt with at a time, and a beginning must be made somewhere. Moreover, I had noticed a curious feature about that particular timepiece. It was clamped to the wall, which struck me as very suggestive, and I thought it quite likely I should be able to discover some kind of a secret drawer concealed within or behind the tall black lacquered case where the will and other papers of which Lord Ashel had told me might be hidden. But in spite of my best efforts I came across nothing of the kind. I then examined the floor of the room at spots on its surface which were at a distance of about eleven steps from the clock, in the hope of finding some opening between the oak boards, but all to no purpose. I begin to think that by some specially contrived mechanism the hiding-place might only be discernible at eleven o'clock, and though the idea seemed far-fetched, I don't like to leave any possibility untested, so I sat down to wait till the hour should strike. While I was waiting, I suddenly heard footsteps, which appeared to come from inside the wall of the room, or from below the floor. I concluded instantly that there was a secret passage within the walls, although I had failed to find the entrance, so I left the library quickly and quietly, 
and made my way to the garden from which I was able to look back into the room through the window. By the time I took up my post of observation, the person I had heard approaching had entered. To my surprise, it was a young lady about whom I seemed to recognize something vaguely familiar, but whom I was not aware of ever having seen before. She was occupied in examining the papers in Lord Ashiel's writing bureau, and after watching her for some time, I concluded that she must be Julia Romaninoff, partly from certain foreign ways and gestures which she displayed, and partly from her present employment, as I knew of no one else who was interested in the papers of the dead man. I imagined that she knew of the possible relationship which Lord Ashiel supposed might exist between himself and her, and that she was searching for evidence of her birth. Whether she was staying at the castle, which I was told all visitors had left, or whether, like myself, she had made her way into it from outside, was a question I could not then determine, though the next day I discovered that she was stopping with Mrs. Clutsam at the fishing lodge nearby. The fact of her being still in the neighborhood, the business I found her engaged upon an unusual one to put it mildly for a young girl, and the hour at which she had chosen to go about it, all gave me much food for thought and I felt that she could tell me news of the stranger who had landed in the bay, and who wore such uncommonly pointed boots. When I recognized her on the following day, a young person who had a few weeks previously made me the victim of a barefaced and audacious robbery, I could no longer doubt that she and the unknown boatman were in league together. And since no Englishman would be likely to wear boots so excessively pointed at the toes, I did not hesitate to conclude that they were both members of the Society of the Friends of Man, a conclusion which became a certainty when I subsequently saw them together. This discovery rather shook my belief in the guilt of young Ashel, though I had an inward conviction that in spite of everything he would turn out to be the murderer. Still I was after the Nihilist Brotherhood as well, and I determined, if possible, to put a spoke in the wheel of that association when I had finished with the first and most important business. In the meantime, as I stood in the dark garden, watching the girl ransack the private papers of her dead host, I felt no fear of her finding what she was looking for. Lord Ashiel had convinced me that he would hide his secret affairs more carefully than that, and, as I expected, the time came when she gave up the search and departed the way she had come. And that way, to my astonishment, was through the grandfather's clock I had spent so much time in examining. No sooner had she gone than I returned to the library where I soon discovered that the hidden entrance lay through the one part of the clock I had not investigated. A trap in the floor could be opened by turning a small knob, and I found beneath it the top of that flight of stairs, which we now know leads out to the door under the battlements. There were fifteen steps in the flight, and my first idea was to examine the eleventh one of them. I was rewarded by the discovery of a concealed drawer, which in its turn disclosed a single sheet of paper. On it were written some words that I could not at first understand, but of which finally, by good luck and with your help, Lady Ruth, I was able to decipher the meaning. They referred, in an obscure and veiled fashion, to the great statue erected by Lord Ashiel in that glen of which his wife had been so fond, where the beginning of the track used by the cattle drivers and robbers of old, which is known as the Green Way, leads up over the hills to the south. Guided by Lady Ruth, I found on the pedestal of the statue a spring, which has only to be pressed when a door in one end of the erection swings open and discloses the hollow chamber in the middle of the pedestal. At the far end of the cavity was the tin box, of which the key lay temptingly on the top. I lost no time in springing towards it, for here, I felt sure, was all I wanted to find. But as I inserted the key in the lock, the door slammed to behind me, and I found myself shut in the dark interior of the pedestal. Luckily, Lady Ruth was with me, and quickly let me out. I found the door was controlled by an elaborate piece of clockwork, which was set in motion by the pressure upon the floor of the feet of any intruder, causing the door to shut almost immediately behind him. But for you, Lady Ruth, I should be there now. But the incident gave me an idea. I returned to the cottage with the papers and found two telegrams. One was from the analyst in Edinburgh, to whom I had sent the grains of dust collected in the gun-room, saying that among other ingredients lime was very predominant. Now there is no lime in a peaty soil such as this, and the gardener, to whom I talked of soils and manures, 
with an air of wisdom which I hope deceived him, told me that the rose-bed outside the library had received a strong dressing of it. There was also, said the report, traces of steel and phosphates, of which there is a combination known as basic slag, which the gardener had mentioned as being occasionally used. I considered that it was tolerably certain, therefore, that young Ashel's rifle had been the weapon, the imprint of whose butt was still discernible on the bed when I went over it. The second telegram contained an answer from the colonel of his regiment, to whom I had written, asking if there was anything in the record of Mark McConachan which would make it appear conceivable that he was badly in need of money, and likely to go to extreme lengths to obtain it. I had told the colonel as much about the case as I then knew, and pointed out that the life or death of a man whom I had strong reason to think innocent might depend upon his withholding nothing that he might know, which could possibly bear upon the matter. The telegram I received in reply was short but emphatic. "'Record very bad,' it said. "'Am writing.' This was enough for me. I went over to Cryannon, saw the police, and imparted my conclusions to the local inspector. I then proposed that a little trap should be laid, into which, if he were not guilty, and had no intention of destroying his uncle's will, there was no reason to imagine young Lord Ashel would step. The inspector consented, and I returned with himself and two of his men to Inverashiel. You know how successful was the ruse I indulged in. I simply went to the young man and told him I had discovered the place where his uncle had put his will and other valuable papers. I explained to him where it was and how the pedestal could be opened, but I said nothing about its shutting again. Neither, I am afraid, did I confess that I had already visited the statue and taken away the documents. I said, on the contrary, that I preferred not to touch the contents except in the presence of a magistrate, and suggested he should send a note to General Tenby at Glenliquit, and tell him to come over and be present when we remove the papers. This he did, and I then left him after he had promised to join us at the cottage in a couple of hours. I knew very well where we should find him at the end of those hours, and, as I expected, he was caught by the clockwork machinery of the pedestal door. End of chapter 22. Chapter 23 of The Ashel Mystery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mary Herndon Bell. THE ASHEL MYSTERY by Mrs. Charles Bryce CHAPTER Twenty Three. Sir Arthur Byrne took his adopted daughter back to Belgium on the following day, since although she would have to return to England to give evidence against Mark in due course, some time must elapse before his trial came on, and he judged it best to remove her as far as possible from a place whose associations must always be painful. Then ensued a series of weary long weeks for Juliet, in which she had no trouble in convincing herself that David had forgotten her. She heard nothing from him directly, though indirectly news of him filtered through in letters they received from Lady Ruth and Gimlet. He had not, it appeared, taken his cousin's guilt, as proved so readily as Mark had affected to do in his own case, refusing absolutely to hear a word of the evidence against him and maintaining that the whole thing was a mistake as colossal as it was ghastly. Only when he was persuaded unwillingly, but finally, that it was Juliet's word which he must doubt if he were to continue to believe in Mark's innocence, did he give in, and sorrowfully acknowledged himself convinced. All this Lady Ruth wrote to the girl, together with the fact that Sir David was still in attendance on his mother, now happily recovering from the nervous shock she had sustained. From Gimlet, and from Messrs. Findlay and Ince, they heard that by the will which the detective had found, all Lord Ashell's money and estate were left to the adopted daughter of Sir Arthur Byrne, known hitherto as Juliet Byrne, with a suggestion that she should provide for his nephews to the extent she should think fit. The will, though not technically worded, was perfectly good and legal, 
and Juliet could have all the money she was likely to want for the present by accepting the offer of an advance which the lawyers begged to be allowed to make. Gimlet wrote further that the list of names of members of the Nihilist Society, entitled the Friends of Man, which he had discovered at the same time as the will, and contrary to Lord Ashiel's wishes, sent off by registered post to Scotland Yard, had been communicated to the heads of the police in Russia and the other European countries in which many of those designated were now scattered, with the result that a large number of arrests had been quietly made, and the society practically wiped out. The foreign guest of the Kryanin Hotel was still at large. The name of Count Pritovsky was not on the list, and nothing could be proved against him. He had moved on to another hotel farther west, where he was lying very low and continuing to practice the gentle art of the fisherman. A member of the Russian secret police was on his way to Scotland, however, and it was likely that Count Pritovsky would be recognized as one of the persons on Lord Ashiel's list who were as yet unaccounted for. Gimlet told them, besides, that he had succeeded in finding the widow of the respectable plumber named Harsden, whom Julia had mentioned as being her father. Mrs. Harsden corroborated the story, and said that it was certainly the Countess Romanonov to whom Mrs. Meredith had consigned the little girl they had given her. Widely distributed advertisements also brought to light the nurses of the two children, both the nurse who had taken Julia out to Russia, and the woman who had been with Mrs. Meredith when she took over the charge of the McConachan baby, quickly claiming the reward that was offered for their discovery. There was no longer any room for doubt that Juliet Byrne was the same person as Juliana McConachan, or that Julia Romanonoff had begun life as little Judy Harsden. All this scarcely sufficed to rouse Juliet from the apathy into which she had fallen. To her it seemed incredible to think with what excitement and delight such news would have filled her a few months earlier. Now, since David plainly no longer cared for her, nothing mattered any longer. Her depression was put down to the shock she had suffered, and efforts were made to feed her up and coddle her, which she ungratefully resented. She had nothing in life to look forward to now, so she told herself, except the horrible ordeal of the trial which she would be obliged to attend. It was in the dejection now becoming habitual to her that she sat idly one fine October morning in her little sitting-room at the consulate. She had refused to play tennis with her stepsisters, not because she had anything else to do, but because nothing was worth doing any more, and because it was less trouble to sit and gaze mournfully through the open window at the yellow leaves of the poplar in the garden as from time to time one of them fluttered down through the still air. How unspeakably sad it was, she thought to herself. This slow falling of the leaves, like the gradual but persistent loss of our hopes and illusions, which eventually make each human dweller in this world of change feel as bare and forlorn as the leafless winter trees. On a branch a few feet away, a robin perched, and after looking at her critically for a few minutes, lifted up its voice in cheerful song but she took no heed of it, and continued to brood over her sorrows. All men were faithless. With them it was out of sight, out of mind, and she would assuredly never, never believe in one again. The best thing she could do, she decided, was to put away all thought of such things, and forget the man whom she had once been so vain as to imagine really cared for her. And just as she had told herself for the hundredth time that she had given up all hope, and had resigned herself to the role of broken-hearted maiden, the door opened, and David was shown in. By good luck she was alone. Lady Byrne was not yet down, and her stepsisters were out, so there was no one to see her blushes and add to her embarrassment. In the surprise of seeing him, all her presence of mind vanished, leaving her speechless and trembling with agitation. For his part, David approached her with a confusion as obvious as her own. Juliet, he stammered, as soon as they were left alone together. I know I oughtn't to have come, but I simply couldn't keep away. Why oughtn't you to have come? was all she could ask foolishly. Because I know you can't want to see me, said the absurd young man, though I do think you liked me pretty well before, didn't you? 
when Maisie Tarver tied my tongue, or ought to have, I'm afraid I should say. But she had enough sense to drop me when I was arrested. She couldn't stand a man arrested for murder any more than you or anyone else could. He said the last words with an air of shamefaced interrogation. Why, said Juliet, who was being carried off her feet on the top of a rapturous flood, what nonsense! You were as innocent as I was. What would it matter if you were arrested twenty times? Well, I shouldn't care to be, myself, said David, without apparently deriving much satisfaction from such a suggestion. Once is enough for me. And anyway, he added inconsequentially, you can't very well marry a fellow who is first cousin to a man who's as good as hanged already. Oh, David, David, cried Juliet, as if that mattered. But who do you suppose I am? Don't you know that he's my first cousin just as he is yours? By jingo, said David, I never thought of that somehow. Then we're both in the same boat. And he stepped forward and caught her by the hands. Yes, David, she said, as he drew her to him tenderly, both in the same boat. And what can be nicer than that? End of the Ashel Mystery by Mrs. Charles Bryce